네, 고맙습니다. 어, 먼저 한국말로 간단히 말씀드리고 영어로 네, 말씀드릴게요. First, I'll give the welcoming remarks in Korean and then uh, in English very shortly. 어, 존경하는 우리 한국국제정치학교 회원 여러분 그리고 유튜브를 통해서 시청하고 계신 여러분 반갑습니다. 오늘은 복합화, 다양화되는 세계 속의 국제관계라는 주제로 국제정치학회와 서울대 통일평화연구원, 서울대 국제문제연구소가 공동으로 국제학술회의를 개최하게 되었습니다. 도움을 주신 김병현 통일평화연구원 원장님께 감사드리고요. 오늘 기조연설을 맡아주신 하영선 서울대 명예교수님, 친야칭 전 외교학원 원장이시자 산동대 석좌 교수님께도 깊은 감사를 드립니다. 오늘 회의에는 한국은 물론 덴마크, 말레이시아, 베트남, 영국, 인도네시아 등 많은 국가의 유수한 학자들께서 참석을 해주셨습니다. 현재 한국의 국제정치학계는 한편으로는 서구의 주류 이론을 적극적으로 소화하면서 한국의 현실에 적용을 하고요. 다른 한편으로는 한국의 국제정치적 현실을 설명할 수 있는 이론들을 적극 만들어가는 상황이라고 생각합니다. 세계 국제정치학계 또한 서구 이론을 포함하면서도 각 지역의 경험과 지혜를 담은 다양한 국제정치 이론, 즉 글로벌 인터내셔널 릴레이션스라는 새로운 분야를 만들어 가고 있습니다. 오늘 회의는 이러한 흐름을 좀더 적극적으로 살펴보고 변화하는 세계 속에서 어떻게 평화를 이루고 각 국가들이 외교 정책을 추구해 나가야 하는지 여러 주제들을 다루어 보고자 합니다. 오늘 회의를 위해 애써주신 은용수 국제정치학회 연구이사님, 또 안두환 교수님께도 감사드리고요. 회원 여러분의 적극적인 관심과 격려를 부탁드립니다. 대단히 감사합니다. Uh, dear members of the Korean Association of International Studies and everyone watching through YouTube, thank you for watching and welcome to today's conference. I'm Choi Song Chun, serving the KAIS as the president this year. Today, on the topic of international relations in a multiplex world, uh, the KAIS and the Institute for Peace and Unification Studies and the Institute for International Studies in Seoul National University co-host this international conference. I would like to thank Director Kim Byung-yeon of the Institute for Unification, Peace and Studies for his support. I would like to express my deepest gratitude to Professor Emeritus Ha Young Sun of Seoul National University and Professor Chin Ya Ching, Distinguished Chair Professor of Shandong University and former President of China Foreign Affairs University. Today, we have highly distinguished panelists from many countries, not just from South Korea, but also from Denmark, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, the United Kingdom, and Vietnam. Uh, in alphabetical order. Uh, thank you very much for your participation. I think uh, you are in a different time zone. Some to some is very early in the morning. So thank you very much. Uh, South Korean IR community has been actively developing theories that can explain the reality of Korea's international politics while learning from the mainstream Western theories, applying them to Korea's international reality. As we all know, the global international relations academic community is developing new interests, that is global international relations, a variety of international political theories. These include the experiences and wisdom of each region and country based on the critical reviews of dominant paradigms of Western theories. Today's conference will take a more diverse look at these trends and address various topics such as how to achieve peace in a changing world and how each country should pursue foreign policy. I would like to uh, thank Professor Eun Yong Su and Professor An Du Hwan for their contribution. We ask for your active interest and encouragement. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. It's my pleasure to give a keynote speech for this thought-provoking uh, conference. I will deliver my keynote speech in Korean. Uh, 오늘 keynote speech로 제가 할 얘기는 코로나 이후 세계 질서 연구를 위한 복합 공생의 새로운 시각입니다. 두 차례의 세계 대전을 치른 후 새롭게 등장한 현대 세계 질서는 미국과 소련이 주도하는 냉전적 갈등을 반세기 동안 겪고 
1991년 소련이 해체했다는 탈냉전과 함께 새로운 평화 번영의 가능성을 맞이했었습니다. 그러나 기대와는 달리 21세기 세계일서는 오늘날 본격적으로 3대 복합 위기에 직면하고 있습니다. 첫째, 세계 질서의 주도권을 확보하기 위한 미국과 중국의 전략적 경쟁은 빠른 속도로 갈등을 심화시키면서 지구적 위기 가능성을 높이고 있습니다. 둘째, 21세기 세계 질서의 지역 갈등은 쉽사리 해결의 돌파구를 마련하지 못하고 미중의 세계 질서 주도 경쟁 속에서 지역적 위기로 발전될 가능성을 보이고 있습니다. 셋째, 현대세계질서는 탈냉전 이후 지난 30년 동안 개별 국가 우선의 부강 경쟁이라는 근대 문명 표준의 자기 모순의 심화에 따라 세계 경제 침체, 9.11 테러, 기후변화, 코로나 바이러스의 세계적 유형과 같은 문명사적 위기에 직면하고 있습니다. 21세기 현대세계질서가 겪고 있는 근대와 탈근대의 삼중 복합에게는 제대로 돌파구를 마련하지 못하면 첨단 과학기술의 혁명적 발달과 전파 때문에 과거 세계 질서와는 달리 사이버와 우주 공간을 포함한 지구 전 영역에서 핵과 전자전쟁을 초래해서 인류 공면의 비극을 초래할 수 있습니다. 따라서 코로나 이후 세계 질서의 연구는 기존의 동과 서, 남과 북, 그리고 지구 국제 정착을 넘어서 주인공들의 자기 재조직화와 공동 진화에 기반한 복합 공생, 컴플렉스 심비오시스의 새로운 길을 찾아야 합니다. 제 2차 세계 대전 이후 세계를 질서를 주도해온 미국은 지구적 리더십 주기 상대적 쇠퇴기를 맞아 신흥 대국으로 빠르게 부상한 중국과 2030년대에 들어서면 국민 총생산 규모가 24조 달러 전후에서 비슷해지고 2050년대에는 대체적으로 군사 균형을 이룰 것으로 전망되고 있습니다. 그러나 미국은 21세기 복합적 신문명 표준을 추진하면서 21세기 중반에도 여전히 세계 질서 재건축의 중심적 역할을 담당할 것으로 전망되고 있습니다. 한편 중국도 21세기 중반에 미국을 뛰어넘는 사회주의 강대국 건설의 꿈을 꾸고 있지만 미국을 대신해 대체해서 세계 질서를 주도하기는 물리력과 매력 양면에서 어려움을 겪고 있습니다. 현재 미국과 중국의 21세기 세계 질서 주도를 위한 치열한 전략 경쟁은 근대 세계 질서 주도를 위한 강성 대국과 신흥 대국이 벌였던 과거의 경쟁과 비교하여 훨씬 복합적으로 경제, 기술, 규범, 군사란, 군사라는 사중 무대에서 진행되고 있습니다. 우선 경제 무대를 보면 미국과 중국의 양국 간 무역 갈등을 지속하면서 세계 및 아태 지역 무역 질서 재건축을 놓고 경쟁의 수위를 높여가고 있습니다. 양국은 관세 전쟁을 넘어 경제와 안보의 연계 수준을 높여서 핵심 기술과 산업 영역에서 공급 사슬 재편을 둘러싸고 국제적 연대 경쟁을 전개하고 있어 개별적 세계 경제 질서 재, 개방적 세계 경제 질서 재건축에 대한 불확실성이 커지고 있습니다. 다음으로 미국과 중국은 21세기 미중 관계를 좌우하는 핵심을 첨단 기술 무대로 보고 있습니다. 미국은 4차 산업혁명을 대표하는 AI, 5G, 빅데이터, 로봇, 항공우주, 양자 컴퓨터 등에서 빠른 속도로 추적해오는 중국을 경제하기 위해 국제적 연대 노력을 진행하고 있으며 이에 대해서 중국은 국내적 기술 역량 강화와 동시에 다양한 국제적 돌파구를 마련하면서 첨단 기술 역차를 빠르게 축소하고 있습니다. 근대 세계 질서사에서 벌어진 기성 대국과 신흥 대국의 갈등은 
군사적 비대칭성이 존재하는 경우에는 첫 국면에서 일단 저 정당성 경쟁으로 시작해서 신흥대국의 정당성 요구가 제대로 반영되지 않으면 다음 국면에서 군비 경쟁을 거쳐 전쟁으로 전개되어 왔습니다. 현재의 미중관계는 본격적인 정당성 경쟁 국면에 접어들어서 미국은 중국 사회주의와 대조되는 미국 민주주의를 21세기 세계 질서의 정당성 기반으로 구축하려는 지구적 노력을 전개하고 있습니다. 반면에 중국은 미국이 이러한 노력을 중국의 핵심 이익을 침해하는 것이라고 비판하고 2050년의 새로운 문명 표준으로서 신시대 중국 특색 사회주의를 강조하고 있어서 양국의 규범 무대에서의 갈등은 심화되고 있습니다. 한편 군사 무대에서 현재와 같이 미국의 군사적 부위가 유지되는 상황에서는 미국과 중국이 정면 대결할 위험성은 높지 않습니다. 그러나 인도태평양의 핵심 분쟁 지역에서 미국이 미국의 핵심 국가 이익을 상호 오판하고 충돌해서 군사 갈등이 확대될 위험성이 있습니다. 더구나 미국은 2050년에 미중 군사력이 경쟁 단계에 이를 것으로 상정하고 육해공뿐만 아니라 사이버, 우주의 모든 영역에서 재래무기, 핵무기에 이어 첨단 정보 기술을 최대한 활용하는 공동 전투 개념에 따라 군사력을 새롭게 하고 있습니다. 중국도 인민해방군을 2035년까지 현대화하고 2050년까지는 세계 최강으로 만들겠다고 공언하고 있습니다. 따라서 미중의 군사력이 21세기 중반에 경쟁 단계에 접어들어서 정면 대결하는 경우에는 과거처럼 단순히 주도 세력이 바뀌는 전쟁이 아니라 인류사의 종말을 초래하는 전쟁의 위험성을 높이게 될 것입니다. 미중의 전략 경쟁이 지구적 차원에서 치열하게 진행되는 속에서 지역 차원의 오랜 갈등 문제들은 쉽사리 해소책을 마련하지 못하고 위기로 치달을 위험성을 내재하고 있습니다. 아시아 태평양 지역을 보더라도 북핵, 타이완, 남중국해 문제들에 대한 관련 당사국들의 핵심 이익의 상충된 해석과 갈등을 쉽게 찾아볼 수 있습니다. 구체적 예로 북핵 문제를 보면 1994년의 제네바 기본합의와 2005년의 베이징 공동성명과 같은 노력이 있었음에도 불구하고 2000, 북한은 2006년에 첫 핵무기 실험에 성공한 이후 지속적으로 핵 무력을 증강해 왔습니다. 북한은 현재 실내 구축 부분 비핵화를 단계별로 동시적 조치로 진행하되 완전 비핵화에 대한 전략적 결단을 내리지 않고 있습니다. 대신 완전한 생존권과 발전권을 보장하기 위한 미국의 대북 적대 시정책 포기에 구체적 표현으로 주한미군의 철수 핵군 축회의 국제 경제 제재 폐기 등을 주장하고 있습니다. 반면에 한국과 미국 같은 관련 당사국들은 첫째 북한 핵 무력 강화의 비용을 극대화하기 위해서 효율적인 제재와 억지를 불가피하게 유지하고 있습니다. 둘째 중간 징검다리로서 부분 비핵화 단계인 핵 동결 협상을 진행하되 완전 비핵화의 진정성을 확보할 수 있는 신고와 검증을 요구하고 있습니다. 셋째, 완전 비핵화의 진정성이 확보되면 비핵화 북한의 생존권과 발전권을 관련 당사국과 국제기구들의 협력으로 보장하겠다는 것입니다. 넷째, 북한의 자생적 비핵화 결정을 위해서 북한의 핵화 또는 비핵화가 21세기 북한의 핵심 국가 이익에 미칠 손익을 북한이 정확하게 계산할 수 있도록 북한 정보화를 지원하겠다는 것입니다. 남북한, 미중 그리고 다른 관련 당사국들의 북한 비핵화에 대한 생존권과 발전권에 대한 셈법이 
쉽사리 합의점을 자지, 찾지 못하고 북한의 핵무력의 증강이 계속되면 1차적으로는 한반도 안보와 군비 경쟁에 불가피하게 부정적 영향을 미칠 수밖에 없고 다음으로는 한반도를 둘러싼 아태 지역의 안보 불안과 이에 따른 지역 핵 확산의 위험성을 불러올 수 있으며 최종적으로 지구 차원의 핵 확산의 가능성이 커짐에 따라 핵 비확산 체제의 위기를 맞게 될 것입니다. 유럽의 근대 국제질서는 19세기 중반 이래 자국 중심의 부국 강병을 새로운 문명 차원으로 문명 표준으로 전 세계에 전파했습니다. 그러나 21세기 지구 문명은 여전히 전쟁과 빈부의 문제를 쉽사리 해결하지 못하고 있으며 특히 생태, 문화, 기술과 같은 신흥 무대에서 새로운 문제에 직면하고 있습니다. 생태 무대에서는 현재 코로나 바이러스의 세계적 유행에 대해 효과적인 면역이나 치료를 하지 못한 채 지구적으로 보건 위기를 겪고 있으며 장기적으로는 근대 질서의 인간 위주 산업화가 기후변화와 같은 위기를 심화시키고 있습니다. 한편 21세기 세계 군사경제 경제 구조적 변화 속에서 주인공들의 상대적 자율성은 커지고 있습니다. 그러나 주인공들의 문화의 문화적 이질성은 지구 테러, 미중 갈등, 북한 핵 문제의 해결 더욱 어렵게 만들고 있습니다. 9.11 테러와 같은 대규모 테러리즘에 대한 문화적 이해는 충분히 이루어지지 않고 있고 미국과 진국의 전략적 경쟁에서 양국은 서로 상대방의 전략 문화를 제대로 해석하지 못하고 있습니다. 북핵 문제에서도 북한과 관련 북한과 관련 당사국들은 전혀 다른 셈법을 쓰고 있음에도 불구하고 상대방 셈법을 제대로 읽지 못하고 있습니다. 따라서 첨단 정보 기술의 발달에 따른 지구 문화의 가능성에도 불구하고 문화 이질성의 심화에 따른 위기는 커지고 있습니다. 21세기 첨단 기술의 혁명적 발달은 역사적으로 종교, 정치, 경제에 이어 새로운 기층 무대로서 자리 잡고 있습니다. 군사적으로는 새로운 정보 전쟁, 경제적으로는 디지털 경제, 문화적으로는 지구 커뮤니케이션, 생태적으로는 균형과 보존의 기술적 가능성을 열어주고 있습니다. 그러나 동시에 첨단 기술의 잘못된 발전과 오용은 군사, 경제, 문화, 생태 문제에서 무대에서 인류 문명의 종말을 가속화하는 위기를 불러올 것입니다. 코로나 이후 세계 질서에서 본격적으로 당면하게 될 3대 복합 위기를 극복하는 연구를 위해서는 3대 과제를 수행해야 한다고 생각합니다. 첫째, 주인공의 복합화라는 새로운 시각이 필요합니다. 미중 전략 경쟁 위기의 극복을 위한 미국의 권력 전이 이론이나 특유대대 3종론, 중국의 신형 국제 관계론 같은 발상은 모두 근대적 자기 중심적 한계를 크게 벗어나지 못하고 있습니다. 미중 전략 경쟁의 위기는 단순히 미중의 생존 문제가 아니라 지구 전체의 생존 문제이므로 주요 관련 주인공들의 공동 참여하는 새로운 대안을 모색해야 합니다. 북한의 비핵화 문제도 핵무기 개발을 위해 경제적 제재를 하고 군세적 억제를 하며 동시에 비핵화의 보상으로서 경제적 지원을 하고 체제를 보장하기 위해서는 복합적인 주인공들의 노력이 필요합니다. 코로나 바이러스 유행의 면역과 치료 과정에서도 신자유주의적 세계화는 모순과 결함을 드러냈지만 동시에 반세계화가 대안으로서 가능성을 보여주고 있지는 않습니다. 따라서 코로나 이후 신중한 재세계화는 불가피합니다. 이러한 생태위의 논의에서는 인류가 생태계에 크게 영향을 미치고 있는 인류세에서 보여주는 지나친 인간 중심에 대한 자성적 논의가 활발하게 하고 진행되고 있는 것을 주목해야 
합니다. 따라서 코로나 바이러스 이후 질서의 새로운 문명 표준에서는 새롭게 등장하는 복합 주인공들을 포함하게 될 것입니다. 둘째, 무대의 복합화를 위한 재건축을 본격적으로 설계하는 노력들이 이루어져야 한다고 생각합니다. 부강이라는 단순 무대의 현대 문명 질서가 당면한 위기를 성공적으로 풀어나가려면 21세기 신문명은 최소한 3층 복합 문대를 건축해야 합니다. 우선 중심 무대에 근대적 위기를 막기 위한 안보의, 안보 번영 무대와 함께 탈근대적 위기인 생태와 문화 위기 무대를 동시에 포함한 4대 중심 무대를 재건축해야 합니다. 정보통신기술혁명은 4대 중심 무대를 새롭게 재단장시키는 기층 무대로서 자리 잡고 4대 중심 무대 중심 무대 모두를 새롭게 변화시키고 있습니다. 그러나 동시에 특히 조심해야 할 것은 인공지능과 같은 첨단 기술의 혁명적 발달이 인간의 행보에 기여하는 대신에 인간을 지배하게 되는 탈근대적 비극을 막기 위한 보완책을 반드시 필요로 하고 있습니다. 마지막으로 4대 중심 무대와 기층 무대를 복합적으로 연출할 수 있는 공치의 상층 무대를 제대로 완성해야 합니다. 셋째, 연계의 복합화에 대한 이론적 모색이 필요합니다. 근대 국제질서의 주인공들은 부국 강병의 무대에서 기본적으로 경쟁의 원칙에 따르면서 전쟁과 빈곤 같은 갈등의 극대화를 막기 위한 최소한의 협력을 연계해 왔습니다. 그러나 21세기 신문명 무대의 주인공들은 경쟁, 갈등, 협력이라는 근대적 단순 무기를 연기를 넘는 복합 연기를 동시에 해야 합니다. 21세기 신문명 재건축을 위해서는 주인공들이 개별적으로 생존, 번영하기 위해서 끊임없는 자기 재조직화라는 자생적 노력을 하되 동시에 무대의 다른 주인공들과 함께 공동진화를 하는 공생의 연기를 펼칠 수 있어야 합니다. 이러한 국제정치의 이론적 모색을 하기 위해서는 뇌과학 연구에서 진행되고 있는 사회 내 연구나 생물학 분야에서 이루어지고 있는 공생진화 연구를 우리는 주목, 주목해 볼 필요가 있습니다. 코로나 이후 세계 질서가 당면할 3대 복합 위기를 복합 공생 세계 정치학이라는 새로운 시각에서 제대로 연구하고 대책을 마련하지 못하면 21세기 세계 질서는 인류사의 공멸이라는 위기에 보다 빠르게 접근하게 될 것입니다. 감사합니다. Thank you, Chairman uh, Ha Young Sun. Um, I do believe his um, his speech, uh, uh, one of the key points uh, as far as I'm concerned of his uh, his his speech is uh, neither U.S. nor China, neither uh, internationalist nor anti-internationalist, neither modernist nor postmodernist, in a position to determine emerging complex new world order. Uh, instead, we got to think about it and try to address the problems. Out of emerging out of a new international world, international order through the through the concept or through the perspective of a complex symbiosis. Uh, so, um, a very very uh, powerful speech there, and I also think that his speech is nicely uh, serving as a sort of a foundational text for us uh, going forward and exploring uh, the nature underlying today's global politics and perhaps. Uh, uh, diverging roles that um, uh, uh, small or middle power uh, can play in terms of the uh, making and, and shaping and even changing uh, the order therein. So uh, without any further delay, let's go uh, straight into uh, paper discussion and paper presentation and panel uh, discussions. Uh, as you know, we have uh, four papers which will be uh, presented uh, during this uh, session number one. And uh, 
as I as I told you before, I'm gonna give I'm gonna give uh, uh, each of the presenters a maximum of 20 minutes uh, uh, for presentation, but hoping 15 minutes uh, will do. Uh, and after the presentations, we will move on to obviously a Q and A session. Uh, so, okay, uh, let me first introduce our first uh, um, presenter, Andu Han. He's a he's an associate professor in the Department of Politics and International Studies, and the director uh, of the European Studies Program at Seoul National University, where he has been teaching international history since. Uh, 2013. His research interests to focus on early modern intellectual history with a special focus on uh, the birth of the first British Empire. He has published widely on this subject and he is currently completing his first book uh, tentatively titled Britain Before the Empire. And his work also appear in, um, appears in academic journals, including history of uh, European ideas. And today he will be talking about English school and the lessons of history. Uh, Dr. An, please. Thank you, Professor Eun, for your kind introduction. And I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Professor Chan for asking me to join this a uh, wonderful workshop and providing me with this great opportunity to share, uh, present my research. And it is my great honor to present my ongoing work to chairman of East Asia Institute, uh, Professor Emeritus Ha. And before starting my talk, uh, may I have a word about my topic? Because when I received and looked through the uh, program of this online conference, I noticed that my choice of topic stands out as, as, as uh, odd. And here are two quick justifications. First, as you may know, it was the English School of International Relations that first called attention to the emergence of global international society in IR, recognizing the significance of the third world uh, as they called it at the time. And secondly, far less well known than the first, but no less crucial, I think, is Henley Bull, the third member of the English school, made extensive use of non-Western IR literature, although he only read English and French. And I have not yet encountered any Western IR scholar, established or not, who have made more use of non-Western IR literature than him. And it is surprising because he did it uh, half a century ago when there was no JSTOR or Google Scholar. So in this regard, I think it is safe to say that English school was a pioneer of global IR. And although as an intellectual and diplomatic historian of 18th century Europe teaching international history, I'm not quite sure what global IR exactly means, but in scope and in communicating with IR scholars outside of the West, the English school was definitely a pioneer in, 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 in that direction. And my talk is structured as shown. As a kind of general background to my argument, I will begin with a brief summary of the historical turn. In particular, I stress that historical, historical turn is consists of two dimensions, one historical IR and the other history of IR, to both of which the English school have made substantial contribution. Then I move on to the main part of my presentation and it is divided into three subsections, historical science, historical comparison, and finally, historically informed and conscious IR. And each is devoted to three key members of the English School of International Relations, respectively, Herbert Butterfield, uh, Martin White, and Hadley Bull. And my focus is on their historical thinking, not their detailed interpretations of history. And I will conclude my paper note by noting that the English school placed as much emphasis on unlearning history as learning history. Um, right. As you all know, there have been many turns in IR and in recent decades, it appears multiplying very fast. So much so that some have described the field as turning everywhere. Although global IR is undoubtedly an important turn, which is gaining momentum as this gathering uh, attests to, 
I want to focus on the history of return, which uh, predates it. The history of return is composed of two rather distinctive parts. On the one hand, it indicates the increase of interest in history among IR scholars. It is true that uh, Wallerstein and Michael Mann had exerted considerable influence on the development of the historical sociology of international relations, but they were basically sociologists. The recent uh, historical turn, however, is IR made. It is propelled from inside, as you can see, uh, for example, in the uh, debate over the West Palian myth of state sovereignty that swept the IR community some 20 years ago. On the other hand, there are a growing number of IR scholars, especially in Europe, instigated in part by Cambridge style intellectual history, who are interested in rewriting the history of IR as a discipline. The traditional rendering of the history of IR on the basis of the great debates has been heavily questioned in recent years. Disciplinary soul searching is uh, taking in place also in IR. Although uh, it is basically Alexander Wendt's uh, constructivism that has persuaded many uh, American IR scholars uh, to take history more seriously, the English school also made a crucial contribution to the uh, first part of the historical turn, as you can see from the list. From diplomatic hist uh, investigation edited by Butterfield and White to the evolution of international society, uh, authored by Adam Watson, the first member of the English school, they were in the vanguard of the historical turn, even, the term, uh, even before the term existed. Not only uh, did the English school with the expansion of international society, a classic example of the historical sociology of international relations edited by Boo and uh, Watson, but more critically, the English school uh, promoted IR scholars outside of the American mainstream to recall and reflect on their national backgrounds. Personally, I think it is, uh, it is long to regard the English school as a patriotic group of IR scholars justifying belatedly the European balance of power, let alone British foreign policy after handing over uh, hegemony to the United States. But nonetheless, the name itself was enough to give the impression or read to the, uh, read to the uh, realization that IR is not the science that can be applied universally, but a science with different national characteristics. And uh, not unexpectedly, there has been there have been a series of attempts to apply the English school notions of international system and international societies to regional history. And such efforts in East Asia without doubt help the formation of the Chinese school. And Barry Buzan have played a key role in that direction. My focus, however, is on the way in which the English school approached history. In the last few years, Ian Ho and Mark, Be uh, Mark Bieber have explored this subject in a number of important articles, but I think it still needs more investigation. In particular, I want to argue that contrary to the conventional wisdom, the English school interpreted history principally to warn the dangers of history. Right, uh, first, the founder of the English school, Herbert Butterfield. Uh, the first thing that we need to remember is that it was against the background of the First World War and the new diplomacy of US President Woodrow Wilson, more especially that Butterfield resorted to history. What worried Butterfield was most, uh, what worried Butterfield most was the moralization of international politics, or as he put it himself, the spread of the ideological diplomacy. Suddenly Germany was demonized and the balance of power was blamed as the culprit of the First World War and the world was divided into good and evil. This had negative uh, ramifications on history or historical writing. Each country began to publish official history to defend what it thought to be national interest. British history was idealized, while German history was summarized in the Jundabek thesis that Germany was destined to political dictatorship and territorial expansion. To counter these two intertwined uh, legacies of the First World War, Butterfield combined scientific uh, history with the Christian notion of charity. 
For Butterfield, good history makes you understand that you are equally blamable for the tragedy. After all, we are all sinners. Uh, that's how Butterfield thought. And in Butterfield's words, I will quote uh, some uh, 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 phrases from Butterfield's history and human relations. There he says, history in fact is so dangerous a subject that we might wonder whether it would not be better for the world to forget all of the past, better to have no memories at all, and just to face the future without ever looking back. The dangers of history are liable to become much greater if we imagine that the study of this subject qualifies us to be politicians or provides us with patterns which we can immediately transpose into the context of contemporary politics. From another point of view, however, we may say that there is a great need for history all the same, provided we conceive it as a process of unlearning. Only if we go on un uh, learning more and more of it, go unlearning it, we will it correct its own deficiencies gradually and help us to reach the required elastic elasticity of mind. Turning to uh, the second member of the English school, Martin White, who studied under Herbert Butterfield as a Cambridge undergraduate student, was of the same opinion. The Second World War did not improve the situation. On the contrary, it wasn't it, as we all know. What might, uh, White uh, learned from Butterfield was that history does not repeat itself. History repeats because you believe it repeats. History is full of unexpected twists and turns. And this is why Butterfield stressed that you have to go on unlearning history. White also uh, was very much against Wilsonian moralism. For example, in the famous uh, article entitled Why There Is No International Theory appeared in 1960, White objected any simple application of political theory to international politics. And here are two quotations from White. They are uh, rather long, uh, but worth reading carefully because they tell us why the English school made historical comparisons. Uh, history, uh, White uh, says, uh, history is a great storehouse of relevant precedents, Machiavelli maintains, because history consists in mechanically recurring cycles. States are governed by pre uh, predestined laws of rise and decay. So the lessons of political experience are true lessons. Mike, uh, and, and uh, White argues, uh, Mike Machiavelli, however, used his uh, historical method uncritically. His examples are abstracted from historical context and applied crudely to current politics. He worshiped Rome and Roman precedents. It is possible to argue that Machiavellians as a school tended to be methodologically uncritical. <laughs> And he, and in other place, Martin Weiss uh, argues, again, historical precedents, even if they can be reduced to serviceable order, shed only an indirect light on pres present uh, circumstances. This is what uh, Thucydides meant when he singled out as primarily worthy of admiration in Themistocles, the grasp of ta deonta. The things necessary, the proper expedient, the decisive elements in the situation, and he linked it not with a sense of the past, but with a sense of the future, a power of uh, divination, an insight into how things would work out. Western foresee clearly the issue for better or worse that lay in the still the future. It is possible that Martin White uh, uh, continues as the world has gone on since those days, politicians and others have increasingly acquired unhistorical uh, perspective. And if a man has a historical perspective, it will be of course color his notion of the task or need of the current generation. But it is not an essential, essential to politi of political thought insight. The strong historical consciousness of Churchill and Kennedy has led Dr. Rose and others to argue that statesmanship is founded upon sense of history. But White emphasizes it might be easier to maintain the converse that the majority of successful politicians and reformers have done without an historical sense. So this is what unlearning history means. Um, last but not least, let me turn to uh, Hadley Bull, the final, uh, uh, the third member of the school. Butterfield was definitely most unhistorical among the three. Unlike Butterfield, uh, Bull, 
uh, I'm sorry, unlike Butterfield and to a lesser extent, uh, Martin White, who had a clear aim of formulating a comprehensive and workable theory of international relations. But what Poole wanted was historically informed and conscious IR. And it seems to me Poole had succeeded in incorporating Butterfield and White's uh, historical insights. Take, for example, Poole's concept of anarchical society. I think there can be other ways to explain it, but in my opinion, Poole was secularizing Butterfield's Christian understanding of the peculiar way in which the providence works. As God make good out of evil, anarchy promotes society. And as Bu contended in the chapter on war in the anarchical society, contrary to popular belief, war fostered order. Another notable example can be found in the expansion of international society, which Bu edited with Watson. Much criticism has been raised against the anthology, uh, particularly by non-Western IR scholars for not having paid enough attention to violence involved in the expansion of international society. But I think such criticism misses the point. All the contributors admitted that colonialism had incurred irreparable damage to the indigenous people. And the book was published in 1984 when dependency theory uh, uh, reminded us the importance of the core and periphery system, how exploitation went on. Yet the English school had intellectual audacity to point out that were it not for the internal crisis and the indigenous uh, as assistance, Western imperialism would not have succeeded at least in the early stage and went on to maintain that the concept of state sovereignty which the West has used to subdue and conquer other parts of the world was a double-edged sword. This is why Bu and Watson placed the Japanese case at the center of the, their edited volume. It was their historical analysis that Japan and will remain as the model in the revolt against the West. And here is my last quotation. This in a way is a self-criticism of uh, of Bo because Bo himself once served as a policy advisor to British government on nuclear disarmament. Bo, uh, at the end of uh, an article society, he, he, he makes it very clear. The search for conclusions that can be presented as solutions or practical advice is, um, is a corrupting element in the contemporary study of world politics, which properly understood is an intellectual activity and not a practical one. Such conclusions are advanced less because they, there is any solid basis for them than because there is a demand for them which it is profitable to satisfy. The fact is that while there is a great desire to know what the future of the world politics will bring and also to know how we should behave in it, we have to grope about it the dark with respect to the one as much as with respect to the other. It is better to recognize that we are in darkness than to pretend that we can see the light. This is the uh, conclusion of the anarchical society. So it's, it's, I, th I think uh, most of IR scholars uh, passes this pass passage as, as just simple uh, uh, concluding remark, but it tells uh, how Bu approached history and what he wants to achieve by uh, going through history in the anarchical society. He was in agreement with Butterfield and White that use, uh, we should always unlearn from history. And history is always un with unexpected turns and twists. And that's uh, what uh, Bo wants to say in this paragraph, uh, I think. So to conclude, the English school approached history with a specific view to increase elast elasticity. Over and over again, the English school won the dangers of history. For Butterfield, White, and Bull, history was full of unintended consequences. As such, it taught to expect unexpected. In this respect, the title of my talk, The English School of International Relations and the Lessons of History, is somewhat misleading one. But, but that you have to unlearn from history is also a lesson of history. And my talks ends here. Thank you. I hope I'm not overspent my time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. An. I think uh, Dr. An's paper presentation is fantastic. Very interesting. 
uh, very informative and the point he's just made during his presentation, such as the point about history as a process of unlearning has a lot of, uh, I mean, provide us a lot of a fruitful thought on an ongoing unfolding debate and discussion about global IR. Because uh, the question remains as far as I'm concerned is uh, what to be unlearned, what to be learned or what to be unlearned. And the question involves politics, real life politics, as well as a disciplinary uh, politics, something that we, we, we want to uh, address uh, more probably during the uh, Q&A session, I guess. Uh, again, thank you. Um, move on to next uh, presenter is a Carla Lumpus Epstathopoulos. Uh, he's, a, he's a lecturer in international politics at Everest West University, Wales in the UK. He is the author of Middle Powers in World Trade Diplomacy, India, South Africa, and the Doha Development Agreement, published in 2015, Palgrave. And his research focuses on Southern Middle Powers and Economic Diplomacy. And he has been published in internationally recognized peer review journals, including International Relations, International Politics, and the Third World Quarterly. And today he will, uh, he will be presenting his paper titled Global South and the Middle Power Concept, the Cases of Brazil and South Africa. So Carla Lumpus, are you ready? Okay, so um, this, is, this is part of the research agenda that I have been uh, uh, focusing on for a number of years now. And to a large extent, it, it focuses on uh, using middle power approaches to analyze the diplomacy of certain states, um, especially states like uh, Brazil and South Africa and previously uh, during the post-Cold War era, India as well. Uh, and gradually it is a project that uh, has evolved to encompass two additional dimensions. The first one is the uh, capacity and relevance of the middle power concept uh, in order to understand the changing position of certain Southern powers in the liberal international order. So that is a first aspect. And then a second aspect, which is, I think, maybe more relevant to this workshop, uh, is about the relevance uh, of the middle power concept when we talk about global IR. Uh, and and uh, the, the workshop was, was a great opportunity for me to think about those, uh, those links. Um, so what I would like to do is to speak uh, in the beginning a little bit about uh, the state of the debate uh, as, as uh, I understand it in the middle power uh, literature and then see how that relates to two cases, Brazil and, uh, and South Africa. So let me just start first with, uh, I think, what is, uh, I, I would say, the, the standard start point when we talk about about middle powers, and that is the definition. Now, now this is uh, uh, this is this is something that we could spend a lot of time discussing because the literature has been focusing extensively on the definitional question for decades now. Uh, uh, I deliberately avoid using the term middle power theory, so I prefer to just talk about middle power approaches because I think we do not have any kind of uniform unified theory when it comes to middle powers. Although uh, I would say that to a large extent, some of the methodological, theoretical, analytical limitations that we see in the literature, they're not necessarily a product of kind of debates in middle power specifically, but in a way reflect, I think, uh, some of the bigger, broader debates in, in IR. So uh, for example, when we see how the debate evolved, when we discuss the emergence of rationalism in the 1990s. So how gradually certain types of neorealism and neoliberal institutionalism came to converge in order to uh, confront, so to speak, the emerging theory of constructivism. That in a way is very much reflected in, in the middle power literature. So, so we see how those broader debates uh, kind of reflect uh, middle power uh, are reflected on different middle power approaches. So, so far there have been many works on, uh, uh, on kind of how we can use certain kind of key definitions, approaches to categorize middle powers. Uh, uh, I think these are known. We talk about the positional or hierarchical model. This is obviously an emphasis on material capabilities. 
uh, it is not yet clear about whether there is consensus about what would be the indicators that we need to use in order to uh, kind of establish that hierarchy. Uh, we know that back in the kind of 70s and 80s, only one indicator could be used, like GNP, for example, or GDP. But recently studies have included more indicators in order to come up with a list of middle powers across different continents. Uh, uh, the positional model has been criticized and the other models have also been criticized. Uh, for example, the behavioral model places emphasis on behavioral attributes, but it has been criticized for its teleology uh, and also for its often cyclical definition. So the fact that uh, we derive certain behavior, behavioral attributes from observing the diplomatic behavior of middle powers, but in a way, uh, those attributes were uh, kind of uh, then kind of recycled in a way in order to try and understand the behavior of other middle powers. So it becomes a cyclical argument. Uh, and I would say, again, uh, we could also criticize potentially the role and identity model because uh, sometimes the degree of internalization into a middle power identity uh, is not fully problematized. So for example, are we talking about middle powers that use the middle power label in a functional way or is, does that truly reflect some degree of socialization into middle power values, like good international citizenship, for example? I don't mean to uh, to uh, to discredit kind of the, of course, the rich literature on on, on that field. I would say quite the opposite. Uh, uh, my uh, approach here is that all of the kind of definitions are relevant, and I think in a way. Uh, most works now use a combination of those approaches because uh, in a way its case will require different emphasis on those uh, on each of those uh, on each of those approaches. The key question, however, I think is is that if we agree that somehow different middle powers will probably reflect a combination of those definitions is what that says uh, about international relations in general. Uh, maybe to reverse the question, I think my, my, my own uh, often curiosity is about whether IR is placing emphasis on middle powers overall, right? Because it is a di discipline that is preoccupied with power and wealth. Uh, we know from uh, uh, many key authors of uh, realism, for example, that the emphasis is on great powers, right? And great power politics or the tragedy of great power politics. So in that sense, how much space there is for middle powers and how that space should be understood. Uh, so do middle powers make a meaningful difference to the conduct of uh, international politics? And by extension, can they also have a meaningful impact on IR theorizing? Related therefore to that, I think initial debate about definitions, there's also a question about the systemic impact on middle powers. There's been certain, some work here as well. For example, the uh, known article by Andrew Carr uh, of, of 2014. And here I think the question sifts because it's not about how uh, middle powers are positioned or self-identify, but it is exactly about that central question about whether they can have a meaningful impact at the international level. Again, I would say uh, the interest of IR, those that do not deal with middle powers, again, might not be too great. We see, for example, how different IR works speak about middle powers. And the first thing I think that becomes evident is that there is a proliferation of concepts. So sometimes we talk about emerging kind of regional powers or emerging, reg or, or emerging middle powers. We see that since the uh, 2006, for example, since the article, uh, a key article was written by Andrew Harrell, we talk about secondary states or second higher states. Uh, again, when we mo move on to uh, uh, to, to survey the literature on multipolarity or unipolarity, we see again an array of different definitions. We talk about middle range states or intermediate states and so on. Uh, I mean, clearly some, some of those terms are used in a descriptive way, in a more descriptive way, uh, uh, but when kind of the analytics, the definitions come into play, we see also that there is a substantial overlap, right? So, so in a sense, similar states, actually the same states, could be described through, through different definitions. Uh, for example, I think middle power scholars themselves have often said that when we go beyond the West, we see really a substantial overlap between regional and, 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 middle, and middle powers. Now, I think the big, uh, maybe the big problem here uh, uh, is what has been seen as Western bias. 
So basically that, that the middle power concept really has evolved to some extent in order to include terminology and vocabulary that reflects the experiences of non-Western states. But really, this is about taking concepts and ideas that were uh, uh, developed in uh, Western IR academia and applying those to, to the non-Western world. And by Western IR academia, I don't just mean the United States, because uh, maybe surprisingly in this case, uh, what is understood as Western bias is actually from, uh, from other communities, other IR communities, for example, uh, uh, Canada and Australia are key, two key examples where we see that in key publications from those IR communities, uh, uh, there is a lot of emphasis on, on, on the middle power concept. So for those outside of those communities in other parts of, of, of the world, there seems to be uh, on the one hand, some of a use and potential uh, theoretical stretching of the middle power concept. So in a way the concept is uh, relaunched every time that there is a new foreign policy kind of project by states in the Western world that seek to justify a special role in international affairs. So basically the middle power concept becomes a vehicle for exceptionalism, right? Or what we call sometimes critically good international citizenship or uh, good Samaritan. So good states, so to speak, of the international community that have a special role to play. In recent years, that, that has led to further debate because now some scholars suggest that the concept should be rejected altogether. So uh, one example is Edward Jordan, who wrote the known article of 2003 about uh, distinguishing between established and emerging middle powers. And in a more recent publication, uh, now suggests that to some extent, the, the whole label of an emerging middle power should, should, should be rejected. So, so it doesn't apply to many states outside of the West exactly because of those degrees of, 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 uh, of bias. Uh, of course, I think the fact that we still have a rich literature in itself, I think that suggests that uh, the middle power concept is still used extensively. So, so maybe it is too early to discredit that altogether. Uh, uh, then the question I think becomes whether there is any relevance still, so, so we can acquire whether the concept is relevant across the global South, obviously with a number of qualifications uh, applying. And then if we potentially there is a relevance, then how that relevance can be applicable to the study of global IR. Now, this is something I, I will not discuss in detail because it is a separate discussion, but global IR, I think seems to be a bridge building project. So it is a project that potentially allows for this dialogue. I think at least uh, that has been the intention of key figures in global IR. So it is not to create new divides, but rather to bridge kind of, you know, to create theoretical bridges between the West and the non-West. Now, there has been criticism on that because I think recent works have also noted that in a way, just by using those dichotomies of the West, the non-West, the South and the North and so on, we might actually be reproducing some, some of those dichotomies. And, and I will admit that, that uh, uh, I will use those, those terms in this, in this, uh, in this presentation. Uh, but, but it seems to me that, that many scholars uh, kind of, uh, that are positions in the global IR canon, they, see, uh, they don't see that as, as a critical project in, in the sense that it doesn't lead to the uh, rejection of key assumptions by what we call mainstream IR. So it is not about that, but it is rather about facilitating homegrown theorizing, uh, uh, as has been noted in the literature, applying existing concepts differently and revising uh, uh, revising uh, 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 existing existing theories. That seems then to suggest that there is potentially a fruitful avenue for rethinking the relevance of, of the middle power concept. I will also say that, that in this discussion, I largely, uh, just for the purposes of, of, of uh, thinking about that relevance, I divorce deliberately the middle power concept from self-identification. So, so, so my argument would be that it stands as an independent kind of distinct theoretical approach and can apply to states that don't necessarily identify as middle powers. Okay, so I, I, I'm aware that there is a strong degree of identification as I said before, and this is part of maybe that original issue of, of Western bias, but, but the two 
are not necessarily connected. So the concept can apply to many states that, that do not identify as, as middle powers. So I think when we talk about, about the relevance, I think the initial question is whether that concept can bring anything meaningful to the discussion of global, of global IR. Uh, my argument would be uh, that, that it does because of two, uh, I would say, uh, uh, simple arguments. The first one is that it does place emphasis on the agency of sovereign powers. Uh, this is not something that, that can be taken for granted because in many structuralist hierarchical theories, uh, non-major powers are often relegated to a follower role. So states that uh, 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 in a way follow options that are determined by the structure of the international system. Uh, even within, I think, middle powers, there is an emphasis on identifying the limitations, the constraints that middle powers face by uh, different balance of power functions at the regional or the international level. So that notion, I think, of agency, that, that in itself, I think, is magnified by certain middle power process. So, so that is potentially a first advantage right there. The second one, and I think, again, it, it is a simple argument, but one that, that is worth uh, restating, is about the emphasis at the international level. In the end, any, I think, discussion about middle powers is about uh, uh, identifying paths to the international order and paths to international forms of, or maybe globalist forms of agency, such as internationalism and multilateralism, the two examples that, that, that I'm using here. Uh, I think that, uh, I think, uh, definition in itself would exclude a number of cases where states are confined to regional complexes, for example, because I think this would be a research agenda that would be closer to, for example, the debates on, on regional powers. So when we look then at the key terms uh, that, that, that we, uh, we can identify when discussing middle powers, how can those terms help us understand the agency of sovereign powers? Going back to the previous point, I would say that the criticism of Western bias here potentially remains relevant. Some, for example, would say that just the use of those terms, like internationalism and multilateralism, those terms in themselves, they do reflect some uh, Western preference for IR theorizing. For example, the terms are often used in neoliberal institutionalism, as I mentioned in the beginning. Therefore, uh, just adopting that language in a way I think reproduces the same uh, kind of original Western bias. I, I think that argument might be uh, rather too critical because when we look carefully at what different approaches used for middle powers have, uh, 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 how those approaches have understood key concepts, I see that there is a substantial variation. So internationalism does not necessarily have to be one of the Western kind of liberal kind. Uh, even I think Western scholars themselves have admitted that internationalism can take uh, many, many shapes. If we look, for example, at the volume written by Cranford Pratt uh, in 1990 about middle power internationalism, uh, there is a discussion about how middle power internationalism essentially is a rejection of, uh, well, not a rejection, but, but I would say uh, rethinking definitely of realism. As, as, as kind of the major IR, IR approach. But at the same time, this notion of humane internationalism, that can be evident in many forms. So we can talk about liberal reform or even radical internationalism. So it doesn't necessarily need to be confined to, to one kind. The notion of reformism is especially important because that has been used extensively in the literature. Going back to Jordan's argument and other, I think, scholars like Alden Nevera, uh, in the post-Cold War era, reformism is used as the discourse, the uh, 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 theoretical framework, so to speak, in order to understand the agency of, of sovereign powers. So in this sense, we are told that the middle powers, the new middle powers from the global south, engage in reformism because they don't want to transform the status quo, but nevertheless, they want to renegotiate key aspects of the global system. A lot of emphasis is especially placed on the global economy. So, so we, we, we are told that key organizing principles of the liberal system like privatization, liberalization, deregulations, those are not challenged by a reformist discourse, but potentially uh, the decision-making uh, structure, for example, of global governance that, that is challenged. Um, under, I think, the same label, we can also open the whole debate about responsibility and this notion of responsible stakeholders. 
Now, going back to Western perceptions about the new middle powers, the criticism there is that uh, those states are not often acting as true responsible stakeholders. I think if we look, for example, at various publications in foreign affairs, I think that that would be a good example from, say, 2000 until 2009, in that decade, we see how that notion of responsible and irresponsible stakeholders resurfaces quite a lot. So the accusation, the, the criticism is that, you know, we need to maintain that language when we talk about, about middle powers and then use that language as the threshold through which to judge, assess the actions of uh, non-Western powers. And therefore, if those do not act in a responsible way, uh, we, need, we need to expose that, that, uh, that, that inconsistency. Again, not, not to focus too much on theory. Again, the same, uh, uh, the same debate can be evident when we talk about, about leadership. So uh, we can use the language of leadership to understand both Western and non-Western middle powers, but that would, I think, assume that a concept like leadership is relevant to kind of non-Western non theorizing on, on middle powers. Uh, more or less, I think same debates can be evident when we talk about, about multilateralism. Uh, that in itself is a concept that derives from very much from Western IR theorizing. And again, that leads many to uh, uh, kind of criticize uh, concepts like multilateralism in itself or good international citizenship. But scholars again have noted, uh, like Andrew Linklater, for example, in his 92 article uh, titled, What is Good International Citizenship? Uh, and Linklater has noted that good international citizenship is not necessarily one that only takes a Western state. So it can be a pluralist one, but it can also be a solidarist one. So there are many forms of good international citizenship. And therefore, if we look across uh, uh, kind of the non-Western world, we can find many, I think, projections of such a narrative, and most importantly, many groups, categories of states uh, across different continents that receive the diplomacy of other states as good international citizenship. Okay, so, so the concept is not necessarily confined to, to a Western, uh, 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 Western variation. Again, just, just to finish this discussion, I would say that, that the same, I think, problematic underpins other key standard definitions of middle powers, like Nice diplomacy. So I think the question is, do we keep those terms? Can those terms be relevant in global IR? Or do they need to be rejected exactly because they still reflect the original Western bias I mentioned at the beginning? The final issue moving kind of from agency to, to the issue of structure is the question of international order in itself. And I think then going back to the original question is whether here middle power approaches can say anything meaningful about the position of a number of south southern states in the international order. Originally, there was, I think, a lot of emphasis in middle power approaches on that question. I think here we might even see surprisingly that different authors from different theoretical camps arrive at the same conclusion. So if we look at, obviously, a major theorist like Robert Cox, writing about middle power massive Japan and the world order in his uh, 1989 article. And then if we compare that argument to what some liberal scholars said in the 1990s, surprisingly, even though we talk about very different theories, uh, uh, they arrive at the same conclusion. And the conclusion is that middle powers cannot act in any transformative capacity, right? They're not capable of, uh, in a way, transforming the international system, either because of choice or because of constraint. In most cases, they will only work, their agency will work to reinforce existing, the existing architecture of, of the international system. The more specialized work on Southern middle powers, I think, really follows the same argument. Uh, there is an expectation that those states will act as legitimizers and stabilizers of the world order. In a way, they are even better suited to perform that role because they are developing countries, emerging democracies that follow, at least initially in the 1990s, the uh, 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 kind of key norms of uh, kind of democracy and open markets. Therefore, they have an even stronger legitimizing uh, potential. When it comes to that final argument of middle powers, I would say that that can also be problematized because I think the actual current trajectory of southern middle power shows a substantial degree of uncertainty. So whereas in the beginning there was great expectation in the West that 
many Southern middle powers would act as valuable partners for the West. Uh, today, uh, the so-called rise of the West, sorry, rise of the rest is uh, a synonym for a certainty, right? If we look at uh, a recent article by Isis Arco in International Relations, uh, she speak about the, the, the collapse of the hype surrounding the rise of the rest, that, that now in, in Western IR communities, that I think strong belief about the convergence of kind of Western and Southern middle power agency towards a support for the liberal order, that I think belief is no longer there. Okay, and, 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 and I would say that moving on to the case studies, I would say that becomes evident when we look at cases like Brazil and South Africa. Uh, two cases that initially I think were a very good reflection of what we can call a third way type of, uh, uh, I think, political, I think domestic and both international international politics. Uh, I'm deliberately using this, this word third way because I think that that initially derives from British politics and, and, and new labor and how uh, new labor government in, in the late 1990s tried to find that balance between uh, kind of a more uh, left-wing uh, uh, kind of policy and at the same time remaining open to the prospect of globalization. Uh, but I think the same kind of middle ground approach can be found in key uh, political parties in Brazil and South Africa, especially the African National Congress and, and, uh, and the Workers' Party. So two parties that dominated really the political scene in those countries and two uh, political parties that really propelled the two states to assume uh, a more activist and internationalist orientation uh, uh, in, in, in terms of, of foreign policy. In, in, in the uh, uh, 2000, sorry, that's 2005 here, uh, article by Alden Neviera, this was seen as a new diplomacy for the global south. Uh, and in that article, the authors use the middle car power concept to suggest that uh, states like India, Brazil, and South Africa actually included, uh, they now engage in a, a plethora of different coalition building initiatives in order to reform global governance on the one hand, but at the same time also reinforce the existing I think, structures and flows of, of globalization. Uh, for many years, I will not go into a historical background here, but for many years, that was the consensus concerning Brazil and South Africa, that the two states were committed to expanding, uh, kind of contributing to the arrangements of the legal order. But in recent years, I think there has been great uncertainty, right? There has been great uncertainty because the trajectory of the two states, uh, when we look at the current administrations, so I'm only focusing on, on those here, uh, shows that that kind of initial commitment to internationalism and multilateralism is not there. As I've said before, I will only reiterate the point, I am not here inquiring the degree to which IR communities in those states use the middle power concept. I would say actually that in Brazil, at some point, the middle power concept was explicitly rejected. So IR communities in that country expected Brazil to play an even bigger role. I would say that those, those I think aspirations have been very much moderated now. Looking, I think, at recent volumes in Brazil's foreign policy and place in the world, I think now authors start reuse, reusing the middle power concept, maybe because I think the choices of successive Brazilian governments have exactly pointed out uh, that, that Brazil could not or would not seek to play a, a more assertive role in the international system. I would say that the current administration especially might be rejecting internationalism all, altogether. Uh, uh, Jair Bolsonaro is, is a president that has kind of, uh, I think, generated much controversy because of a, a language that essentially amounts to anti-globalism or to, to use a term uh, that is used by uh, ministers in the government, universal conservatism. So this is a term that, on the one hand, I think maintains some degree of international engagement, and there is a rhetorical claim to supporting democracy, open markets, and the values of, of, of the Western world. But at the same time, the actual practice of the Bolsonaro administration has led to a lot of controversy. Uh, for example, there have been, uh, I think, quotes suggesting some, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, reconnection with Brazil Brazil's past as, as a dictatorship, the belief that the military should be the guarantor of political institutions in, uh, in Brazil, 
the rediscovery of key uh, Christian slash Western values, uh, like, uh, uh, like uh, the nation, the family, for example, these are also notions that are projected quite heavily by uh, the Bolsonaro administration. Uh, and I think all of those uh, uh, suggest that, uh, going back to, to, to the definitions discussed earlier, that, that maybe the notion of internationalism cannot really be relevant when, when, when discussing about Brazil's uh, current trajectory. Uh, now, I have to say that we also would need to look at what happens within Brazil's political establishments because different, I think, factions within the government have different understandings. So here we would need to open up the box of the state in order to see how different wings of the government might be favoring a more globalist or a more isolationist approach. Uh, the same, uh, I think, contradictions can be evident in, in the case of South Africa. Uh, so for example, we would see that the current uh, government of led by Cyril Ramaphosa, by President Ramaphosa since 2018, uh, has sought to restore uh, South Africa's post-apartheid international image. So, so that was a time when South Africa enjoyed this, I think, image of the rainbow nation, as it was called, because it was seen as maybe the most progressive force uh, across, across, uh, uh, across, across Africa, and also as a model state uh, in, in, the eyes, in the eyes of the West. Uh, in recent years, uh, uh, that image has very much been tarnished. Uh, uh, one issue in particular that has been especially damaging for a state that sought to be a good citizen was uh, different xenophobic incidents across South Africa. That has been a source of major diplomatic frictions between the African Union, other African states like Nigeria, and the South African government to the degree that the South African government admitted that it can no longer contain that problem immediately. So, so uh, the government had to send envoys to other African capitals in order to try and somehow rectify this, this major problem of where uh, uh, African nationals from other African countries have been subject to those xenophobic attacks across, uh, across South Africa. Any notion of internationalism, going back to that concept, is also conditioned by what we see some selective engagement with the international order. So rather than having uh, following a Catholic endorsement of internationalism as in the past, as that was evident in, in South African foreign policy, what we see today is that there is some sense of pragmatism, that South Africa only needs to engage with those institutions that are beneficial for its economic development, right? And those can be free trade agreements at the regional level, like the one promoted by the African Union now, or other institutions like the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank. Again, therefore, the notion of internationalism uh, becomes, becomes somehow questionable. The same thing can be said about multilateralism, going back to that, to that concept as well. Do those states display the level of commitment to multilateral activism that we would expect from middle powers? Uh, the answer, again, uh, uh, would be, uh, I think, only a partial yes. Uh, looking at, at Brazil's, uh, uh, Brazil's uh, uh, approachment to multilateralism, that seems to be highly selective. There is a, a focus towards cooperation, uh, but that only seems to be limited to conservative right-wing governments across Latin America, and in some cases, Europe as well. During the Donald Trump administration, there was a substantial rapprochement between the two leaders, between uh, President Bolsonaro and President Trump. Uh, uh, many saw that as potentially a reflection of the same, the same common values. Uh, there was, I think, a sense in the US foreign policy establishment that, that, that that was an opportunity to create a rift between Brazil and China, exactly because Brazil had been part of the BRICS in, in the previous years. And in Brazil itself, that was seen as an opportunity for Brazil to restate its Western credentials. So the idea that Brazil is part of the Western world, even though it maintains some sort of Southern identity uh, as well. When it comes to actual multilateral agreements, uh, the government withdrew from the UN Compact on International Migration. It threatened to withdraw from the 15, 2015 Paris Climate Accord. In the end, it didn't follow that because there were threats from the European Union, especially that if Brazil withdrew from that, 
then there would be no further negotiations concerning trade between Mercosur, the regional agreement, and, and the European Union. So again, we see how that notion of economic pragmatism resurfaces again. The wildfires that were reported widely in the news a couple of years ago uh, that, that hit the Amazon, that was also a source of major criticism because Brazil was understood as having a major responsibility here because of you know, the important role of the Amazon ecosystem in climate change, but the response of the uh, government was that this is Brazil's sovereign space. So uh, states in Europe that had kind of destroyed their own ecosystems were, were in opposition to criticize Brazil because it maintained its own authority in how it managed the ecosystem. Be beyond that rhetoric, the Bolsonaro administration has somehow moderated its rhetoric. So now it actually accepts that there must be some action in the Amazon where deforestation has progressed uh, rapidly. So it accepts that it does have some responsibility and some, uh, 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 well, maybe some uh, uh, kind of degree of uh, uh, a kind of commitment to the international community when it comes to that, to that, to that issue. In comparison, uh, uh, I would say that South Africa's moving on to this uh, uh, kind of case, commitment to multilateralism has been more evident. Uh, for example, uh, only in a short period of time, South Africa will be, uh, is acting actually uh, 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 for the past two years as a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council. Uh, the two first terms have been, uh, well, a rather traumatic experience because the, the discussions of those terms was that South Africa was often uh, coerced into accepting the positions of the permanent five. Not always, however, it should be noted because on certain critical issues like resolution uh, 1973 on the no-fly zone of Libya, South Africa voted in a different way. So in the Security Council, South Africa has always tried to balance between, on the one hand, uh, showcasing its commitments to human rights and democracy, but on the other hand, respecting solidarity with African states. So, so it doesn't want to violate the unwritten rule that African states do not interfere in its other's uh, internal, internal affairs. Uh, there has also been some uh, strong degree of collaboration with, uh, uh, with key organizations like uh, the World Bank, for example, when it comes to tackling COVID-19, up until last year, at least, uh, South Africa attempted to use funds from uh, uh, the World Bank, for example, in order to tackle COVID-19, and that was seen as, as a successful case. Uh, the government itself is trying to demonstrate that commitment, but again, uh, we have to, 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 to say that when it comes to multilateralism, there is also the economic pragmatism dimension. So the government is reviewing the number of international missions that it has, so it has a total of 126. And the understanding is that the ministry, the Department of International Relations, should only be maintaining those diplomatic missions abroad that have some economic benefit for South Africa. So it is not an ideational or ideological commitment to multilateralism, but one that is driven very much by trade and investment. The one thing, and, and that will be my final empirical point, the one thing that both states have in common is a growing, I think, skepticism towards economic collaboration with China. Both countries were originally part of the BRICS, but today I think there are two effects. Uh, first, uh, China's economic presence is impacting directly now the economies of those countries, and many politicians, political parties are now rethinking economic associations with China. And second, that means that the potential approachment, re-engagement, with the United States uh, now becomes actually stronger. So uh, going back to, I think, the notion of how middle powers understand their position potentially in the international system, it seems that there is a preference for uh, kind of maintaining what seems to be a secure and more predictable role in a Western-led liberal international order rather than assuming a more potentially a certain role in an international order that is also called by China. I, I think in most, I think in the two countries, we can see a lot of political debates moving, uh, moving in that direction. Uh, uh, the Bolsonaro administration has clearly questioned Brazil's association with, with China's uh, uh, investment project, projects in Latin America. So, so that is one reflection there of the growing skepticism. 
and South Africa is also quite uh, skeptical about China's presence in other states across Southern Africa. Okay, so those are seen as economic activities that actually marginalize South Africa's own leading position as the leading economic power in trade, investment, finance, services, and so on. Okay, so I will, I will finish the, the discussion here because I'm thinking I'm probably, uh, uh, okay, running out of time. And I will simply, uh, I think, uh, go back to, to the original idea and try to rethink whether the concepts discussed in the beginning have uh, still any, 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 uh, any relevance. So uh, I talked about internationalism and multilateralism. Uh, surprisingly, I would say that current governments in countries that have in the past been described as middle powers cannot completely disassociate for the, from the internationalism of previous years. It seems that internationalism is, is still used as the threshold, maybe mostly in the West, but potentially outside of the West, uh, through which the agency of those states is assessed in the international system. Now, normally, uh, states like Brazil and South Africa could simply reject those expectations and could simply suggest that those, I think, Western notions of internationalism are not relevant to, uh, uh, to, to, to the international choices of those states. The problem, however, is that when this, I think, rejection happens, then that also has an economic cost, right? So states that have invested at least three or four decades into building an internationalist reputation as good international citizens, when they decide to backtrack from that commitment, that potentially has economic, economic implications. And those states do not want to suffer uh, in terms of uh, status degradation or loss of image, because that, that is also an important source of diplomatic capital in itself. The second aspect is about, is about multilateralism. Uh, again, it is not easy to come up with an answer here because I think middle powers are, by definition, also selective in how they practice this diplomacy. And with Brazil and South Africa, we see that sometimes there is a partial withdrawal, but multilateralism, again, still remains an important attribute to, to the foreign policy. So again, there is an economic drive here because that is the necessity. There is an urgent, I think, drive to secure flows of trade and investment. Uh, 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 but uh, uh, there the doesn't seem to be, I think, any I think, serious thought at the moment that there can be a, an alternative to that. So to conclude, uh, uh, I think, all, all of that empirical discussion, I think middle power approaches do remain fragmented. Uh, as I said in the beginning, there is no, I think, unified or uniform theory. They do provide, they do provide a vocabulary with terms like global international citizenship, leadership, coalition building with like-minded states, internationalism, multilateralism. And here I think the important question for global IR is if that language is relevant. As I said before, I understand there will be quite a lot of criticism. Some would say that those terms, they still carry a lot of Western bias, so they cannot be used to reflect the experiences of non-Western states, but nevertheless, uh, when we look at the actual practice of those states, we see that there is a lot of gray area. So, so it is not kind of a, a yes or a no situation. So we see that there is some path dependency, elements of internationalism and multilateralism, and potentially elements that take a different shape. So it is possible to have, I think, different variants of internationalism and multilateralism, and maybe different variants of middle power approaches altogether, that might have something meaningful to say to, to, global, to global IR. So uh, I, I will leave it at that. I think I'm definitely over the, the, the 15 minutes. Uh, so, so I will stop there. Thank you, Dr. Carla Lompus for giving us a uh, uh, very detailed and stimulating uh, presentation about the concept of middle power. I think you've given us a lot of new insights uh, into the concept of middle power and how to rethink uh, the middle power concept and how to do uh, middle power study uh, better. I mean, how to make the analytical purchase of the concept of middle power uh, greater and more nuanced uh, from the perspective of uh, both Western and non-Western uh, words. And I also think that uh, Carla Lumpur's discussion about middle power is nicely linked to our next paper. Uh, which will be delivered by Tuidu, right? So she 
uh, she will give her paper uh, titled Vietnam's Emergence as a Middle Power in Asia, Unfolding the Power Knowledge Nexus. Uh, let me just briefly introduce uh, Tui Du. She is an Associate Professor and Vice Dean of the Faculty of International Politics and Diplomacy at the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam. Her previous affiliations include the Australian National University and Nanyang Technological University and East West Center in Washington and Japan's Institute of International Affairs in Tokyo. Her research and teaching interests include non-Western IL theory, multilateralism, East Asian studies, and Vietnam's foreign policy. Uh, Thuy, please. Yes, uh, uh, the earlier speaker have said a very beautiful scene uh, when he's talking about global middle power. And I focus on uh, a case of uh, what we call uh, emerging regional middle power, uh, which I would argue that uh, Vietnam should fit in that case. And I also link it to how the rise of Vietnam as the emerging middle power in Asia has helped stimulate uh, the IR knowledge uh, in Vietnam concerning uh, the middle power behavior. So next slide, please. Um, yes, uh, so you see it here, here uh, my uh, paper actually uh, uh, was it, it consists of uh, three parts. Uh, the first uh, I talk about uh, uh, the power knowledge needs us and is relevant to the Asian IR. Uh, and second, um, particularly, uh, I'm talking about uh, uh, Michael Foucault's um, discussion about the interrelationship between power and knowledge and how ha it has been incorporated into uh, the existing uh, discussion about the rise of uh, Asia, the right, particularly the rise of uh, China. Uh, and the research of Japan and also the rise of India and how it, how it had stimulated about indigenous uh, theory development in those uh, what we call big power. But I also argue that uh, in uh, Amitabha Jaria uh, vision about the multiplex world, we will see uh, that, that power is diffused not only from uh, power, power shift from the west to the east, but also power diffusion um, from the big power to the lower layer of the power structure, including uh, power diffusion from the red power to uh, the middle power and also the smaller, lesser state, uh, and including the small power in the system. So uh, I argue that uh, if the power knowledge nexus uh, has been applied to the case of uh, great power only. So in the multiplex world, uh, the power knowledge nexus uh, should be uh, revisited uh, to incorporate uh, also uh, the how power knowledge is uh, considered and uh, is um, uh, showcased in the case of lesser power. And we have been talking about how uh, the rise of uh, 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 as my colleagues have just mentioned uh, about uh, South Africa and also Brazil and uh, India and also uh, South Korea, Indonesia, uh, the rise of the middle power there have uh, stimulated um, was the interest uh, in developing global IR and uh, non-Western IR theory in those countries. So I argue that the need to visit uh, the power knowledge linkage uh, in the context of global IR. And uh, lastly, I apply it to the case of Vietnam, how uh, previously be you know, perceived as a small power and now with its uh, newfound uh, power as a rising was a regional middle power, at least in Southeast Asia or East Asia, have uh, stimulated um, the discussion uh, of IR and non-Western um, IR in Vietnam. So we see here that uh, um, at the moment, uh, uh, Foucault uh, argued that um, uh, with the uh, power stimulate knowledge and uh, at the same time, knowledge sometimes serve the interests of power. So, uh, uh, 
scholar has been argued that uh, uh, the emergence of, for example, the Chinese school bio theory is a matter, actually is the, uh, the outcome of the rise of China. And I, I also have a, a paper on this, on uh, China rise and the Chinese dream in IR theory. So they have been uh, rising to great power status and uh, Xi Jinping coined up uh, the term of like uh, Chinese dream and how the Chinese scholar uh, probably uh, later this uh, afternoon, Professor Chin Yajing will elaborate on that. And but, but this also applies to the case of Japan uh, when I also study that uh, how Japan researchers uh, as a regional leader have uh, stimulated uh, the discussion uh, within the Japanese IR scholarship uh, about uh, a Japanese contribution to IR theory and uh, focusing on uh, the concept of um, Japan in the international society and also the in-betweenness uh, based uh, of the Japanese scholarship based on the concept like the Kyoto School of Philosophy. But it also applies to the case of India, uh, um, the richness of uh, uh, Buddhism and also uh, the ideas of uh, uh, Kautila and uh, uh, the ancient uh, Indian thinker. Um, but at the moment, as I have just been mentioned, we also see the gap in the literature uh, about how the lesser power in, in Asia, uh, we have to see, see some like um, uh, initial case by South Korea, uh, as the um, professor Chun Chia Song had just mentioned about a uh, Korean IR community uh, also try to develop theory that can uh, capture uh, the access and the practice of uh, South Korean foreign policy. So we also here see the case of uh, Indonesia, Thailand, and uh, Vietnam, maybe the late uh, in the summer, uh, but uh, still uh, we will see uh, uh, right here on how it stimulate uh, in the case of Vietnam. Next slide, please. So we see here, um, uh, uh, the middle power literature, uh, first, they talk about middle power status, first uh, in terms of the hierarchical ranking. So mostly in, in um, uh, judging uh, from their uh, soft power and hard power criteria. And uh, if, if we can see here, judging from the realist, uh, quantitative uh, accounts of uh, middle power status, you can see that how Vietnam sit at the, the power ranking uh, in the global at the moment from um, the area to population uh, defense spending and GDP uh, and um, science and technology and to soft power. Uh, I would argue that uh, uh, Vietnam does not meet uh, many uh, criteria in the realist sense of uh, quantitative term in terms of being a, a, a global bit of power, uh, but it had the potential uh, to become uh, the bit of power in the future. And actually Vietnam uh, at the moment, uh, the 30, uh, the 13 party Congress uh, set the goals for Vietnam to become, uh, uh, we say that um, uh, an industrial power with a uh, high income by uh, 2030. Uh, so we see an, an advanced economy by 2045. So it have, it had the orientation and I would argue that uh, it does somewhat meet uh, the criteria in quantitative term as the a regional emerging regional middle power in quantitative terms. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we can see that uh, that is the hierarchical, uh, hierarchical approach, uh, the functional approach that my um, earlier speaker have just mentioned. Uh, uh, Vietnam at the moment uh, also interested in uh, what we, uh, the middle power theory had just been talking about niche diplomacy. It focused on the niche um, that uh, all the middle power uh, also share the interest and also Vietnam uh, also share the interest including climate change as Vietnam is one of the country who suffer the most from the impact of the negative impact of the climate change. So it brings the issues of climate change everywhere uh, with a bilateral uh, um, diplomacy as well as multilateral uh, setting. Um, and um, uh, maritime security in lieu, including uh, uh, what we call maritime sustainability in terms of uh, ocean plastic uh, or, uh, or else, and also in terms of um, water security. And um, uh, most recently, uh, 
uh, they focus on uh, women empowerment. So those uh, that uh, those issues that Vietnam are interested in uh, has somewhat meet the criteria for for for, for niche diplomacy, and it has formed the network with other small and middle power in terms of these niche diplomacy area. Uh, in terms of the behavior approach uh, that uh, uh, Professor uh, Atta Tofolos have just mentioned about the pension for multilateralism and good international uh, citizenship uh, behavior of the middle power. So Vietnam is quite interested in, in multilateral platform, not only ASEAN, uh, the Mekong, uh, the, the cooperation mechanism within the Mekong and greater Mekong uh, area. And at the global level, it is quite interested in the UN system. Uh, so it tried to apply for uh, being a non-permanent member of the UNSC. And now it is serving uh, for the second time at the UNSC. And at the UNSC non-permanent membership, Vietnam raised many issues, uh, including uh, um, Protocol here conflict resolution uh, to uh, uh, the issues of uh, women, the role of women and children in conflict, and it has sent uh, the peacekeeper uh, uh, up to now a dozen uh, peacekeeper to Central Africans and South Sudan. Uh, so it has somewhat reflect uh, the behavior of middle power in terms of their support for this, uh, the multilateral system, as well as the, uh, uh, Vietnam describe itself as uh, a responsible member of the international system. And particularly, it's raised the issues of uh, the rule-based international order, particularly uh, when it comes to uh, the settlement of uh, the South China Sea issues. Uh, so, and lastly, uh, the system, uh, the systemic impact um, approach uh, argue that uh, uh, a middle power need to keep the balance among the red power and it can act independently against, uh, somewhat against the will of the red power. And in this sense, I would argue that Vietnam do well uh, in terms of uh, this criteria when it has maintained um, very well, pretty well the relationship among the red power. At the moment, Vietnam is um, uh, the strategic partners and comprehensive partner to all five permanent members uh, with different ideologies. So it has been uh, the strategic partner uh, with uh, China, Russia, India, Japan, uh, and um, the UK, France, but, and also a comprehensive um, partner with the US. And um, uh, Vietnam adopted the what we call the three no policy independently, no alliance uh, with a foreign country, no military alliance with a foreign country, no alliance of other countries in Vietnamese soil, and no uh, collusion uh, with uh, not going with one power against the other uh, power. So it means um, this is uh, what we call the balance of the relationship. Uh, and it build a network of strategic and comprehensive partnership, not only with the red power, um, the middle power, including South Korea, but also uh, most of the ASEAN member are Vietnam uh, strategic partnership. So uh, all the, next slide please, all these suggest that, uh, I would argue that as the, um, my earlier speaker have just mentioned, uh, the middle power theory do have relevant to the non-Western case, uh, but uh, the case of non-Western uh, case like Vietnam can also add to the global IR in some sense. I would argue that Vietnam does not meet uh, does not meet the criteria in terms of the hierarchical uh, uh, approach. Uh, it has somewhat meet uh, the functional and behavior approach, and it fits very well in terms of the systemic impact approach. But uh, um, a single lens cannot, um, say, describe the, the Vietnam uh, um, behavior in terms of it meet the power behavior. So I it would argue that eclecticism uh, could be uh, the best way to study about the behavior of, in the case of Vietnam, in terms of foreign policy, in terms of middle power behavior. And uh, in the recent article on the Pacific Review, I would I argue that the case of Vietnam uh, would also uh, help enrich global IR 
when I base uh, on the term of agency. So it, if agency is the capability of uh, a state in uh, realizing its interests, so we can base on that concept of agency to judge uh, about, um, uh, to conceptualize about middle power. And I would argue that if uh, agency can be used at the um, uh, uh, foundation for conceptualizing about middle power, and then Vietnam can uh, be considered as the, uh, a middle power in that it had you know, somewhat and to a large extent rely its national interest to the extent that the middle power can maneuver in the multiplex world. Of course, there are many restraints, but at least uh, as of emerging middle power, Vietnam has somewhat realized its um, national interest and also reserve and promote its identity and international standing. Uh, and also um, the emerging um, of Vietnam uh, as the middle, uh, regional middle power has somewhat shifted the geographical focus and the IR discourse in Vietnam, and particularly uh, is the stimulate burgeoning interest in developing a Vietnamese school of diplomacy based on Ho Chi Minh thought, which I will discuss later. Next slide, please. So we see here first. Uh, it will help enriching uh, Western-centric uh, middle power theories, um, uh, as I have just mentioned, based on the concept of agency. And in Vietnam, uh, there has been growing IR discourse that talk about uh, middle power. And on the left, you can see that uh, um, uh, a volume edited by my colleagues, and I also contribute on that, on niche diplomacy. Uh, the new direction and new priority for Vietnam diplomacy to uh, 2030. And on the right, you can see that my edited book on middle power diplomacy, theory, international practice and implication for Vietnam. So we see although Vietnam has not called, the Vietnamese leader have not called themselves uh, a middle power, uh, the Vietnamese scholar, they, for, uh, they watch closely the behavior of Vietnam and they employ middle power theory, and then they try to extend the middle power theory uh, beyond what um, the existing Western-centric diplomacy has to say. And uh, at the other hand, when they study about middle power diplomacy or niche diplomacy, they also suggest policy relevance. I mean, I say, which direction and uh, which should be uh, say, the niche that Vietnam should focus on on how Vietnam should promote its middle power um, with a uh, behavior in the international standing. Next slide, please. And uh, you can see here uh, also the linkage between um, uh, power and knowledge on how Vietnam respond to the power shift, uh, particularly the impact of China, uh, China rise. So you see that uh, China occupy, I would say that uh, 50 or 60% of the uh, central uh, what is it, uh, the focal, uh, the focus of Vietnamese IR scholarship uh, focus on the, the, the rise of China and related issues, including uh, as the, the keynote speaker have just mentioned, uh, Sino-US uh, geopolitics, uh, China initiative, China ASEAN uh, scholarship and China foreign policy, uh, everything related to China. Uh, is uh, quite closely uh, monitored in Vietnam. And you can see that the Vietnamese respond that uh, uh, China right has to stimulate both the alternative theory as well as uh, the attention to Chinese political thought. Uh, my colleagues have uh, studied very well about China notion of soft power, China notion, China vision of a uh, world order, including tensia, relationality, and um, um, community of uh, shared destiny. And um, uh, you know, but you can see also uh, the trend here that because uh, theory has not been uh, paid due attention in Vietnam. So we are at just the moment, uh, we are at the state of importing um, Western theory. So you can see that uh, uh, many Vietnamese scholars also believe that uh, uh, China right stimulate policy rather than um, theoretical debate in Vietnam. And uh, 
uh, scholar, although we we are we understand the Chinese idea and uh, theory very well in Korean Confucianism, uh, Sun Tzu thought to uh, relationalism to Tianxia and everything else. But uh, the key framework that scholar apply in analyzing their work remains uh, the Western paradigm and the Vietnamese practice. So we see that uh, these are uh, somewhat a mixed response uh, to the power shift. Uh, but uh, you can see the clearer uh, strand is the geographical, the shifting of ge geographical focus of the Vietnamese scholar. Uh, before um, Vietnamese scholar pay attention to much to the big power relation. And uh, during the Cold War and um, uh, from the very, um, uh, with it um, coming out of the Cold War, it still focused very much on uh, Russia, uh, former Soviet Union uh, state, and also uh, other third world countries. But when Vietnam integrate into the region and the world, you can see the uh, the ge uh, geographical focus of Vietnamese scholar have also been shifted. Uh, at the moment, uh, you can see that Southeast Asia and East Asia occupy uh, uh, the largest um, research interests uh, of the Vietnamese scholar and um, followed by, uh, you can see that uh, other uh, like Western Europe, North America or cross regional data, uh, but you can see that uh, uh, the shifting focus. Uh, and this, I would argue that uh, match with the focus of Vietnam foreign policy um, when it focuses on regional integration, uh, ASEAN uh, membership, and uh, promoting the ideas within uh, the initiative to promote uh, cooperation within ASEAN and also uh, the East Asia Summit, uh, the APEC, uh, in short, the Asia region. Next slide, please. And lastly, uh, I would argue that uh, the rise of Vietnam with more material and also more confident in, in the international uh, arena, uh, has stimulated discussion. Uh, it's a very new uh, development in Vietnam. I think it, uh, in um, the past two or five years, discussion about the Vietnamese school of diplomacy based on Ho Chi Minh thought. Uh, if you study uh, Ho Chi Minh thought clearly, uh, you can see that uh, uh, eclecticism uh, characterized Ho Chi Minh thought. He uh, reflect a first on realist idea in that he believed that uh, um, the current uh, world order uh, is shaped by uh, power politics, and we need to uh, closely watch uh, the power relation among the big power. But he also uh, believed that each country should act on its uh, national interests. So this reflect the realist notion in Ho Chi Minh thought. But Ho Chi Minh thought is also characterized by uh, his liberal and idealist thinking. Um, particularly uh, his notion of uh, um, uh, uh, the impact of uh, French and also American uh, constitution uh, in his declaration of independence when he mentioned uh, all uh, the ideals uh, about um, humanitarianism, independent freedom uh, and the like. And uh, uh, most clearly, we can see the impact of Marxism and Leninism uh, on his worldview, uh, world and particularly how uh, we can use, uh, what is it, third world countries, particularly Vietnam, uh, can use Marxism and Leninism uh, to gain independent for the countries. And uh, one of the things uh, that is interesting is that uh, he tried to uh, localize uh, all these uh, uh, ideas into the Vietnamese context. And um, uh, he developed uh, what, uh, what we call the motto for the Vietnamese diplomacy and foreign policy making at the moment. That is firm in principle and flexible in strategy and tactics. I think that it is different to, to, to Thailand bamboo diplomacy. So firm in principle, uh, principle that is the Vietnam independence and Vietnam national interest, Vietnam freedom, national interest. So that is uh, what we should be firm. Uh, but we also be flexible in strategy and tactics depending on um, the world situation, uh, regional context, and um, Vietnam capability, uh, and, and depend on uh, the target 
uh, of the relationship, uh, it, whether it's the big power, is it a middle power, is it a traditional friends, or is it enemy uh, kind of. So um, if you follow uh, the Vietnamese foreign policy making, um, it has been uh, what we call uh, the the key guideline for the conduct of Vietnamese uh, foreign policy making at the moment. And um, he also tried to combine the Western and Eastern philosophy. Uh, he is trained in uh, French uh, culture, but he also speaks Chinese uh, very well. And you can see that all the things uh, that uh, apply to his diplomatic skill, including keeping face for the big power, even if we defeat them, uh, we will men in, in Chinese culture. Uh, and also uh, how to uh, employ the Vietnamese culture of tolerance and looking forward in dealing uh, with the big power and other uh, with the, uh, friends uh, and um, uh, partners in the international system. Uh, and uh, uh, many people argue that uh, it has a great influence on the Vietnamese for, uh, foreign policy uh, today, uh, and uh, including um, uh, Vietnam uh, integration process, multilateralism, uh, and also uh, his notion for uh, being a response, um, uh, Vietnam uh, current notion for being uh, uh, a responsible of the international uh, politics. So um, uh, here, I would argue that, uh, uh, next slide please. This could uh, have uh, a contribution to the global IR. And you can see that uh, these are the survey of uh, Vietnamese uh, perspective on the need to develop uh, an indigenous uh, theoretical framework. Uh, most of them believe that it's a very important or somewhat important uh, for Vietnam uh, to, uh, for the Vietnamese IR community to develop some kind of theoretical framework. And I would argue that the Ho Chi Minh thought uh, on international affairs and diplomacy could be uh, uh, the most likely uh, was the input uh, for, uh, for, for, for the uh, Vietnamese contribution to global IR. And um, next slide, please. So in conclusion, uh, I would argue that uh, uh, in short, that uh, knowledge production in the multiplex world is not the monopoly of neither the West nor the red power. With the power shift and power diffusion in the 21st century, uh, multiplex world uh, is required uh, IR knowledge to be uh, diversified. Uh, that is the notion of what we have been very familiar with the idea of uh, global IR. And um, Vietnam has the good potential to contribute to global IR uh, in the multiplex world, given its um, um, proactiveness, uh, rising power you know, and status in the region, at least at, I mean, uh, in Southeast Asia and broader, in East Asia and Asia, uh, proactivism in international and regional affairs, and uh, the richness uh, of um, the Vietnamese culture, uh, historical experience in dealing with the big power um, and also uh, the richness of this um, um, cultural uh, tradition and political thought. Uh, I would end it here. Thank you. Thank you, Tui, for presenting fantastic paper. Um, I think it has a lot of um, a lot of interesting points that we all want to have a close look at and further unpack. Uh, uh, in relation to uh, not only to um, middle powers, diplomacy or subjectivity, political authority, but also to uh, enriching uh, the ongoing global I IR debate and scholarship. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, our, la our last presenter of, of this session number one is Chung Sui. Uh, he is a associate professor and head of uh, Center for Asian Studies at the Institute of Malaysian and International Studies of National University of Malaysia. He received his PhD from Johns Hopkins University. He is currently a non-resident fellow at the Foreign Policy Institute of Johns Hopkins University. He uh, previously was the postdoctoral research associate at the Princeton Harvard China and the World Program and the Visiting 
a research fellow at Oxford University's Department of Politics and International Relations. And his research concentrates on smaller state external policy, China's foreign policy, Asian security, and international relations. He served as head of the uh, writing team for Malaysia's inaugural defense white paper. And he is also co-author of Rivers of Iron, Railroads and Chinese Power in Southeast Asia, uh, published in 2020 and co-editor of the Institutionalizing East Asia. Uh, his essay, The Essence of Hedging, won the uh, Michael Rifle Memorial Prize by the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies. And his current projects include Hezing in International Relations and Geopolitics of Infrastructure Connectivity uh, Cooperation. And today he will be talking about small state agency in regional connectivity uh, building. So please, Chung Sui. First of all, I'd like to uh, say that I'm very happy uh, to be here um, seeing my good friends, uh, old friends, uh, Chae Sung and also uh, Tui Du, and also uh, meet with uh, new friends here. So um, uh, on the suggestion of uh, Yong Su, I've decided to uh, present a small state perspective to uh, the very theme of this panel, which is a global IR. And uh, I would uh, have only three slides in the next uh, 10, 15 minutes that I have. I have only three slides uh, to unpack, three uh, issues uh, that I thought would uh, present or highlight how small state the agency can actually uh, play a role in the regional connectivity uh, building. That I think is a, a key issue in the global IR research agenda. So for that purpose, uh, I, uh, the three points, the three, uh, in, uh, the three slides that I have, is uh, number one, I would uh, use one slide to uh, highlight why I think regional connectivity building should be a core area, core subject in the global research, in the global IR research agenda. And uh, secondly, I'll move on to uh, the very issue of uh, agency and particularly small state agency. And third and finally, I will focus on the case of uh, Malaysia's role in the institutionalization of SKRL, meaning Singapore Kuming Real Link. And uh, for those of you uh, who are not familiar with uh, SKRL, uh, Singapore Coming Rail Link, I think this map uh, will provide uh, some illustration as to uh, uh, what kind of a uh, rail link and also the scope uh, that uh, it tries to cover. And it's not really uh, new. It has been uh, in the top for, in fact, uh, centuries. Uh, it's part and parcel of the Pan uh, Asia Railway. And uh, of course, the uh, different uh, colonial powers uh, have a different vision. But uh, the one uh, particular vision that I'm trying to uh, focus on is the one vision that provided by regional countries itself. And uh, in the form of uh, Singapore Kuming really that connects Southern China and also uh, different parts of uh, Southeast Asia. So um, uh, Malaysia, particularly under Mahathir 1.0, play a big part, uh, which uh, I spend, I would just uh, spend a few minutes to uh, illustrate uh, some key points, the uh, details uh, in the uh, paper. So to cut the long story short, uh, Singapore Kuming Rail Link uh, basically has uh, three routes central route from uh, uh, Kunming all the way to uh, Laos, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, Singapore. There's a central route, but there are also a Eastern and also a Western uh, that uh, involve uh, Myanmar, involve uh, Vietnam. Yeah. I will leave uh, the detail uh, aside. Let me uh, just very quickly uh, to focus on why, the reasons uh, why I think regional connectivity uh, building uh, should be included in the global IR research tradition research program. So the first uh, reason uh, is uh, exactly uh, what I think uh, basically all global IR scholars have uh, emphasized to be uh, uh, categorized and also uh, developed as a uh, part of the global IR agenda. It has to be inclusive and also uh, universal. So meaning that, that it should cover not just on the Western uh, or, or the uh, mainstream areas, but also uh, as uh, global as possible. So as of now, and as of now, meaning 21st century, we know global connectivity is actually a global phenomenon. It's not uh, limited to any national boundary, but it's everywhere. Even in the case of uh, South Korea, we know that under um, President Moon, uh, as a part of the uh, so-called new Southern uh, policy. 
you have a peace, you have a prosperity, uh, you have a people to people pillar. And a big part of uh, the prosperity pillar uh, certainly has identified infrastructural connectivity building, but not just a hard connectivity, but also soft connectivity as a one issue areas where South Korea wants to contribute. And we know that it's not just uh, South Korea and also other middle powers, but uh, the big powers, China and also uh, other uh, competing powers are also trying to uh, play a big role in connectivity uh, building, particularly infrastructure. China's Belt and Road Initiative uh, is one big example, but you are also seeing US and also uh, other big powers trying to push back uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative on infrastructure, but also other forms of uh, connectivity uh, building. So uh, looking, uh, if uh, putting aside or ignoring uh, uh, neglecting connectivity building, it would not be a promising a start for global IR. And there are other reasons why uh, connectivity building must be included in global IR. That's about the interdisciplinary uh, studies. So Yong Su was very kind to mention about my uh, uh, recent book with uh, my two co-authors, uh, Reverse of uh, Iron. So we spent a few uh, summers actually going around uh, the region in Southeast Asia, trying to uh, look into uh, how different smaller countries in Southeast Asia look at China-backed uh, real projects. Um, um, that is, of course, the newest version of Singapore uh, Kuming Reeling. But uh, China's version is different from what the uh, ASEAN countries uh, tried to promote since 1990s, in that uh, what ASEAN's version is about the uh, conventional reeling, while uh, China currently is trying to promote the high-speed uh, real version of a uh, 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 real, uh, real link. And we knew that, in fact, uh, the first one is going to be completed within a few, uh, few weeks uh, in the form of a Laos China uh, uh, reeling uh, project. And during that, the field work uh, it, uh, shows to us that uh, these particular corporations across the countries, regional countries, but also uh, smaller countries and big powers, it's a very multifaceted, it's a certainly a interdisciplinary uh, in nature because of a real project, just like any other infrastructure projects, it's not just about development. It's not just about economics. It is also political in nature and political at all levels. And it is also involving some social cultural aspect as to some subnational actors within some national boundaries certainly have a big role to play. There are simply multiple stakeholders. So, uh, um, Regional connectivity uh, certainly helps to unpack the nature of global IR as a research agenda in terms of interdisciplinary uh, 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 dimension. But there is one more reason before I move, move ahead uh, to the next uh, section is that it also helped to uh, engage and also uh, deepen our debate on the so-called uh, multiplex, uh, multiplex world. Again, uh, uh, a term, an uh, important term coined by Amitabh Acharya. So I think Acharya has uh, uh, unpacked uh, this uh, multi-conceptualized, uh, multiplex uh, world in terms of there, are, uh, there is a multi-level uh, agency in international relations. So infrastructure development uh, shows that there are multiple agency at work. It's not just big power agency, but also small state agency and even a subnational uh, agency. Which brings me to my second uh, slide. I will try to uh, make it uh, shorter. So agency, and particularly a uh, small state uh, agency, it's an uh, important part of uh, connectivity uh, development, either in terms of uh, real, in terms of uh, other projects. Uh, when it comes to uh, China's Belt and Road, many commentators and researchers, especially outside of Asia region, tend to portray it's also it's always about almost always about big power push. Look, overlooking that small states sometimes push China. Small states are also sometimes push back uh, China. So small states, despite the disadvantageous uh, physical uh, limitations, certainly has an agency. And uh, how do we uh, define an agency? Here I try to uh, uh, offer one definition. Agency can be defined as the capacity of an actor, even smaller actor, in turning or translating our preferences into desired, and actualize the uh, outcomes on ground. And we can uh, unpack the stages uh, into initiation, different stages, like uh, the stage of uh, initiation, negotiation, implementation, so on and so forth. In each of these uh, stages, you could see that it's not just about big power trying to push their agenda. Smaller countries do uh, have uh, agency activism 
in uh, put forward some initiative in uh, shaping uh, the negotiation process, even to suspend uh, some projects uh, between here and now, depending on uh, how domestic uh, uh, sentiments uh, emerge, especially in the democratic uh, countries. So let's uh, unpack small state agency into different levels. I think every uh, researcher, different researcher will come up with a different level, but I would uh, offer, especially from our research uh, uh, projects, there are at least three that uh, we can uh, uh, focus on. We can disaggregate small state agency into three levels, three micro processes, national, the governing elites, the subnational, either uh, competing elites or bottom up uh, social groups, but also external. Yeah, external, uh, depending on uh, whether we're dealing with just one power or two or more competing powers. And usually, from smaller countries' perspective, the more the merrier. And this is where I think uh, South Korea and many other powers have a big uh, uh, role to play. And fundamentally, I think a small state agency is important because of it really illustrates and reflects uh, the very features of a multiplex uh, world. Amitabh did not use uh, exactly uh, the MMM uh, words that I'm uh, highlighting here, but I think uh, he won't uh, protest uh, for me to uh, simplify it as multi-actor interactions, multi-domain interdependence, multi-level governance, but also multifaceted modernities. And all of these uh, multiplex, uh, and also uh, is a multiplex, not multiple world, uh, pardon me, uh, certainly is reflected uh, very well in uh, SKRL, uh, Singapore Coming uh, Railing. And this is my final slide. Uh, and also my final part, uh, final point, uh, just to use uh, how Malaysia, smaller country, middle power, uh, depending on how you uh, define it, but uh, certainly a non-big power. So non-big power can also play a role in uh, shaping, in uh, performing some agency, in translating a long talk about idea uh, of a Trans-Asia Railroad into the form of the idea of a SKRL, Singapore Coming Railing. And it was first proposed in the context of an uh, ASEAN meeting in uh, December 1995. Mahadeo proposed that uh, the idea and uh, evocating not all ASEAN countries are involved, only uh, seven ASEAN countries, primarily the mainland, uh, all the way to uh, the peninsula Malaysia and also uh, Singapore, uh, but also not just about ASEAN, but also uh, China, because the whole idea is to connect Southeast Asia to the emerging uh, power in the form of uh, China, uh, in Southern China, uh, Kuming, and now with uh, the very extensive uh, high-speed rail uh, going on in China, we know that uh, this is actually connecting transboundary real physical infrastructure network with the one over the other. Uh, to cut the long story uh, short, so uh, after Mahadir proposed uh, the SKRL idea in 1995, and that's uh, 26 uh, years ago, we have seen things are happening uh, very, very uh, uh, fast, but also in a mixed uh, picture. Fast in the sense that the institutionalization of this corporation is an interstate corporation, as I said, involving seven ASEAN countries and China have happened within months, not uh, years. So a few months after uh, Mahadeo put that proposal, he already convened a uh, working uh, group uh, a meeting in uh, Kuala Lumpur in 1996. And we all know 1997, 1998, that was a time East Asian countries had been struggling with uh, Asian financial crisis. So for two, three years, the meeting was off, but very soon in 2002, uh, again, uh, the meeting has been uh, resumed and institutionalized. When institutionalized, we know that uh, it's not ad hoc, but every year, ministers from these uh, seven uh, countries and also China come together and uh, meet how can we actualize the idea of uh, SKRL. And then uh, because of uh, Malaysia's uh, active uh, role, Malaysia has been uh, hosting uh, the regional secretariat for this uh, corporation from 2004 until uh, 2007. And in recognition uh, of uh, the activism, Malaysia was uh, appointed in 2007 as the permanent uh, chair, along with uh, ASEAN uh, secretariat uh, to promote and also uh, to institutionalize uh, SKRL uh, corporation. And in due course, Malaysia also uh, shaped the direction of this corporation in three ways. So uh, SKRL is not uh, to construct a new railroad uh, connecting uh, South China and also uh, ASEAN, but it's actually to uh, connect the dots, to uh, upgrade the, the existing uh, railroad that's uh, already in China and also a different part of Southeast Asia, upgrading by double tracking, 
by also uh, electrifying uh, the railroad, but also connecting missing links. They are already pit and pistol of uh, different parts of the railing in different countries. What we need to do is just to connect the missing links and also to build uh, some extra spur lines. And uh, so those are the details. We won't have time. Uh, I know uh, I have only one minute left. So the detail, I won't be able to uh, elaborate. But for those of you uh, who are interested, uh, in addition to the book uh, that Yong Su uh, introduced uh, earlier on, there is also a special uh, issue that uh, just came out uh, in uh, Asian perspective. Uh, a Korean-based uh, journal uh, uh, by Johns Hopkins uh, University. So we have a different ASEAN countries uh, perspective uh, 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 talking about not just the real connectivity cooperation, but the belt and road in nature. And again, you could see different forms, details of small state uh, agency uh, uh, being a uh, play out. And I will stop here. Um, thank you uh, for your attention. Back to you, Yong Su. Thank you, Chang Chui, for a very quick but powerful presentation. And I think uh, your, pa your paper presentation shows very well uh, how small or weak states can actualize, can exercise their agency uh, within the uh, current context, uh, within the current context of international relations filled with multiplicity, complexity, and interconnectivity. So. Uh, that is something that we need to uh, think more about later on. Um, it is time for a, a discussion, as you know, but literally we don't have much time left, uh, just four or uh, three minutes left. But uh, why don't we have uh, at least 10 or 15 minutes if you guys are okay with it? Is it okay? So at least 10 minutes. So for the sake, uh, for the sake of saving time. Uh, this is how I will do as the chair of this session number one. I'm going to take a bunch of questions and comments from anyone interested in engaging with the uh, papers presented today. Uh, uh, and then let the full presenters to reply uh, as, as quickly as possible. So if you if anyone has any comments or questions, uh, regarding the presentation, paper pre presentation, just let me know by raising your hand, raising your hand, or just by using uh, raise the hand button in the Zoom uh, program there. So, is anyone um, okay? Why you you raise your hand? Uh, thanks, Yong Xiu. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, I have a short question to uh, Dr. An. Um, I'm also an English school student uh, who is very interested in reading, especially Hedley Bulls and, and uh, the, the next generation of English school. And um, my, my uh, own project is to uh, bring English school as a, a theory to understand Indonesian foreign policy. Uh, with regard to your, your very nice uh, excellent presentation, uh, which was Yong Su uh, concluded as uh, what should we learn and what should we unlearn from history. Uh, could you please give me a, a clue or a suggestion? Uh, I used to publish uh, a few articles about English school and Indonesian foreign policy, but I'm, I'm still not able to, uh, to understand which part of a country uh, or let's say Indonesia, which part of the history that we have to learn and which part of the history that we, mm. we, can, we cannot, uh, we, we can unlearn mm. uh, to understand Indonesia's foreign policy. Is this the pre-European uh, colonialism history or, or, or others? Thanks very much. Thank you, Ai, for your questions slash comments. And in your tank, you just raise your hand, right? Uh, for all presenters, I, I would like to a few questions for each presenter. First, um, Professor Ang, you talked about English school, and it is interesting to take history as you know, you know, serious matter in order to understand IR and IR theory. I wonder whether what kind of research agenda you think that. English school can offer, provides to reflect better on contemporary issues such as US-China uh, 
competitive you know, competitions these days. And for who is next? Uh, for uh, Professor Charla Lampos, I, I wonder that whether mid powers can play a role in not necessarily established or already established international order, but in the making of world order or you know, in the making of international you know, regional uh, order agenda settings, something like that. And for um, Professor Judy Tu, uh, I don't know how to pronounce your name, sorry for that. And what would be um, distinctive uh, knowledge that Vietnam would produce? You know, I don't see that any distinctive knowledge production actually is just knowledge in nexus in a connection rather than distinctive knowledge productions. So if you explain that, it would be more interesting. And for, um, for Professor uh, Chang Yu Cook, I wonder that, I liked that the point you pointed out the um, engaging the debate on the multiplex world sounds pretty much like um, you point out we need to embrace more interdisciplinary studies. So I wonder whether there are, um, you know, enough, enough room for IP scholars. You know, interdisciplinary studies, you emphasize that. I think, you know, all presenters tend to focus on IR theories, but there are a lot of, you know, um, interdisciplinary studies in IPE. So whether you think that maybe you can take it from IP scholars or traditions it's like that. So, so you, can, you can answer my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lim. Um, Professor Chun, do you have any comments or questions? I would like to give, uh, give you an opportunity to engage. Sure, with sure. Yes. Yeah, uh, because all presentation were really excellent. I have many questions, but I will ask two questions to probably all the uh, you know presenters. First one is at the end of Dr. You know Kalalampos's uh, mm -hmm. discussion, uh, there was a very interesting point that Chinese you know economic expansion or some kind of assertive uh, you know economic policy is very cautiously received by South Africa. Uh, I think that is common to other countries as well, to Vietnam, to Malaysia. Uh, so how do you uh, explain why, you know, China's uh, probably goodwill uh, in economic policy is uh, received in that manner? Uh, is there any way that China can improve its policy? Uh, so that was the first one. The second one is, uh, even though there is a coherent foreign policy of one country, uh, that country's structural position in different issue areas are different. For example, in South Korea is relatively weak in uh, security architecture in the region, but very strong in uh, digital technology, for example. So it's very hard to have a overall comprehensive position uh, in global politics or great power rivalry. So how can we theorize uh, this different structural position uh, in different issue areas? Uh, that's very complex, you know, a task to theorize middle powers, policy and position. So is there any way that we can, you know, have some combined and comprehensive idea uh, for the middle power from policy? Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Chan. Uh, I'm gonna take one, just one more uh, set of questions slash comments or suggestions. So any anyone interested in engaging in the papers? Okay, yeah, that's what I expected, and that's what I hope for. <laughs> Professor uh, E. Yongo, could you okay, please? So, uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity. <laughs> so uh, I have a very simple question. Actually, some of us uh, normally are uh, very self-critical in uh, for discipline of. In international relations, that is, we have 20 theories. <laughs> every book, every, every article I read, they, they also offers a kind of theories, too many. That's I cannot remember. 
So doing a global IR, do you, don't you think that you guys contributing to further fragmentation of IR? That's my question. That is uh, probably one of the well, fundamental- Everybody. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's okay. right, that's right. Uh, one of the fundamental issues that uh, we, we, need to, uh, we need to think about and how to address, how to approach. Uh, but uh, for now, uh, let me give uh, each one of the four presenters uh, to reply to the questions or comments that you guys uh, just received. And literally, we've got less than four minutes. So uh, I want to ask, I want to insist each of the presenters to reply uh, in one minute, less than two minutes. Okay, less than two minutes. Okay, starting with uh, Chang Sui. Thanks very much, uh, Yung Su. Uh, this is mission impossible, but let me try. Uh, I think very quickly, uh, the first answer to uh, 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 Dr. Lim's uh, question, uh, I think yes, uh, IPE and many other uh, subfields uh, certainly has a big role uh, to play when it comes to uh, researching about regional connectivity because of uh, the nature of uh, the phenomenon. I think already uh, not just IPE, but also scholars of uh, political economy have also uh, contributed greatly in a number of uh, uh, empirical uh, studies. And then to uh, secondly to Professor uh, Chen Chai Sung's uh, excellent question, uh, I would uh, certainly uh, think that uh, to theorize uh, uh, would certainly involve uh, uh, efforts to come up with uh, 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 op operationalizable uh, parameters across uh, concept across cases. So for example, the issue of a middle power, I do think that uh, it's possible to pursue that uh, provided we have uh, some defining attributes that can be applied to uh, not just middle power, certain countries uh, in one region, but also uh, all regions. So for example, uh, I would uh, define a uh, middle power ship as uh, consisting of uh, three eyes, right? So uh, number one uh, is the initiative. Number two, uh, it's about the um, um, uh, initiative and then number two is about activism and, th and thirdly is about uh, impacts. So these three uh, common parameters would allow uh, countries and researchers to uh, apply uh, this to unpack uh, how different uh, smaller countries, why some smaller countries are able to uh, play the role as middle power. Some might uh, have an initiative but no, do not have an activism or they might have an initiative activism but no impact then shouldn't be a middle power. I think that would provide uh, some possible uh, uh, framework to uh, proceed. And finally, for uh, um, I think Professor Yim, right? Uh, I sorry, I can't, I miss uh, overlook your name. That's about the further fragmentation. Um, so my short answer is that I think that's the whole point. Uh, we need to uh, fragment it to unpack uh, because of the dynamics uh, has always been very, very uh, complex in uh, every region and in, in uh, every issue. So uh, a very broad generalization would not uh, really help us to understand what are the dynamics that underpin uh, the issues. So further fragmentation, I think is a good thing. And that's uh, perhaps the whole idea of a global IR and multiplex world. I'll stop here. Thanks a lot, thanks a lot. Uh, Tui? Yes, I, I will be brief about the distinctiveness of, of, of the knowledge that I've just mentioned. Uh, first, I believe uh, there is a distinctiveness over there in terms that uh, you, you are right in terms that it's a nexus or uh, mixture, but um, usually you can mix between among the Western paradigm, for example, eclecticism, you can mix between uh, realism, because uh, constructivism and liberalism. But in the case of Vietnam and Ho Chi Minh thought, you can see that he can bridge between, what is it, Marxism, realism, liberalism, and yes. some kind of, so we see, so we see that is really, really um, what distinctive in, in the Vietnamese view. And as I just mentioned, Vietnamese worldview is from the post-colonial socialist state worldview. So that mm -hmm. the make is really different. So uh, applied it to uh, to answer uh, the red power politics, uh, Professor Chun Chia Sung had just mentioned. Uh, similar, you can hardly find a countries that uh, either the, the strategic partner to both China, U.S., Russia, Japan, South Korea. They mm -hmm. have many India. They have many many problem among themselves. But mm -hmm. Vietnam is 
we say a strategic partner to all. I think that maybe probably because that is really distinctive in the Vietnamese way of behavior, even if eclecticism is a distinctive. And last point I, I, I would like to mention is that the global IR does not call for distinctiveness. That is a non-Western IR theory. So distinctive Chinese school, global IR call for diversity, and as Ching Chu had mentioned, even fragmentation. Mm -hmm. So even if it does not have any distinctiveness, but it can contribute its voice and somewhat different perspective on international relations, that's the contribution to global IR. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thanks a lot. Uh, Professor Anduhan, uh, please, less than two minutes, please. Uh, right. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, uh, questions. Right. Yes. Uh, uh, what to unlearn and what to learn in history is, I think, the key uh, element in my presentation and the things that I should answer. But uh, let me uh, answer to the uh, two questions. And I think I, I understand correctly. Uh, first, as I mentioned, and as you know better than myself, there have been many attempts to apply the English uh, school notions of international system and international society to national as well as regional history. Mm -hmm. And I do not think uh, such attempts are uh, mistaken and, and they have their own values. But the English school, as I understand it, and as I presented today, was equally concerned about IR becoming too nationalistic. I'm shamefully ignorant of Indonesian history and, and, and how it has been written and how you employ the English school concept to explain it. But if it idealizes uh, Indonesian history or used to justify Indonesian foreign policy, Butterfield and White and Bull might have raised some objections. I think we've lost Professor Anduan for yeah. some technical issues. Professor An, do you hear me? Okay, I think we are facing some technical issue. Um, why don't we go straight to Kala Lumpus uh, and have his uh, short reply? Could you, could you Kala Lumpus? Uh, yes, uh, very briefly, um, the, the question on the agenda kind of setting institutional institution building role of middle powers. Uh, it, it seems that a lot in the literature has been written about kind of the need for middle powers to act in concert, but I, I think a lot of it is still kind of derives from uh, Western academia, basically. So uh, there are many articles, even newspapers, I should say. I mean, there have been articles in Financial Times, for example, saying that middle powers should step up. But when it comes to the question about whether that concert includes different types of middle powers, there's no certainty. So some say it should be a concert limited to Western states. Uh, and, and then some say that, that you know, non kind of Western democracies should be on board, but others are more skeptical. So, so it seems to me that, that this is that there's some ambivalence there. Uh, China's, uh, China's goodwill, uh, I, I'm not sure how that is received today by South Africa and, and, and Brazil. I think the key question is democracy. In, in, in the beginning, it, the BRICS were mostly an economic phenomenon, but now I think the issue of democracy is becoming greater. So democracies like Brazil, India, South Africa are, I think, seriously considering their position in the future international order. Well, what is their position under that? It's not clear. So and I think uncertainty is fueling those fears, right? So, so in, in some sense, they, they prefer the certainty of kind of the old kind of established US-led order. Uh, so, so I think it's it's kind of the old kind of insecurity uncertainty there that's fueling a lot of those fears. Uh, the question about theorizing different structural positions, uh, uh, th that I think is is definitely, uh, I think a key a challenging question. And I, so, uh, uh, and I realize that that uh, uh, I think th this is very much the appropriate question. It's not about theorizing the structure generally, but I think is about that theorizing different structural structural positions. I, I'm afraid I don't have an answer as it is now because I think this is this is definitely a challenging question. But I would say that for middle powers, there must be an interest in this sort of engagement. So, so there must be an interest to the legitimacy of the order itself, 
not to the authority of different actors like China and the US in that order, but the order itself. I think this, this is really the, the fundamental question. Actually, surprisingly, like different middle powers might maintain kind of a self-image as being more responsible guardians of the order than Chinese mm. or US unilateralism. They, they, they must see kind of their citizenship and responsibility has a bigger commitment to the order than the actions of the US and, and China. So, so kind of in their eyes, such unilateralism is irresponsible and their own multilateralism is the real commitment so to the order. But I think that's a key question that needs to be assessed across different regimes, maybe not, not overall as if there's just one answer. So, so I think this is, this is definitely a key question. The final point about fragmentation, uh, I myself, I was not kind of, I'm not sure about all of kind of the debates in, in global IR. I mean, my sense, as I've said before, was that it was about less fragmentation. That, that was my, my understanding. So you, you, you can still have kind of different kind of clusters, mm -hmm. if, if I can say, of national kind of homegrown IR or regional one, but they must all be leading to one kind of central dialogue. If, if I understand correctly, but, but I was saying before, I think that that leads to, I think a lot of thinking about the vocabulary of IR. I mean, I just used the, the term liberal order. Do we still keep that, for example? Can we still talk about the liberal international order? Some would say no, and I, I understand that. Some would say that this is, this is a concept that you know, has a lot of historical ideological baggage. So, so I think that, 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 that I understand that, that a, a lot and this answer, I think, depends on how we decide, not only about theories, I would say, but also about concepts. So like the example of multilateralism that I used before, the example of order or structure, it, it really comes down to how we want to treat those concepts. So, so this is just one thought on that. Thank you. Thank you, Carl Olympus. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Ahn back, so I want to give him uh, uh, just one minute, okay, given the time left uh, to, to continue to his, uh, continue his uh, reply. Yes, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, my, my computer just uh, uh, stopped working. And, and I think I gave uh, two answers. First one was that um, the English school might have raised questions about idealizing national history or regional history and using IR theory to justify uh, their own country's foreign policy. That's one thing. And the other thing that English school, the early members uh, would have raised uh, questions uh, is the misuse of history. And we see uh, many misuse uses of history in recent years uh, because of US-China relationship getting worse. And, and to see that as trap is one thing that you have uh, a competition between Sparta and, and, and Athens, and it is repeating again uh, today. And another uh, example is the uh, comparison of US-China relationship to that of Britain and Germany uh, at the start of the First World War. And, and, and so, that's the that's the thing I think the English school might have uh, raised uh, might have said that you should unlearn history to learn history. So instead of just saying that it repeats, you have to look at the differences between the circumstances, and there you will find a new uh, path to overcome the uh, uh, predicaments. And, and, and finally, what I want to uh, um, ask, and this, this, is related, this is related to the second uh, uh, session, and I wonder whether global IR is just a combination of many nationalistic or patriotic uh, 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 theories of international relations. And by emphasizing the global uh, aspect of international relations, are we not just throwing the baby out of the bucket? Mm. Are we not forgetting the importance of scientific nature of international relations? And I think this is related to, in particular, to the Chinese school, because it, in a way, justifies the Chinese foreign policy. And that's, I think, is very worrying. And that's the thing that Butterfield and White and uh, uh, Bu might have raised really great concern. Mm. 
Mm. And that's what I think, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahn. Um, just quickly, I don't, I don't read global AI in terms of nationalist, nationalism. As a matter of fact, global AI is quite opposite to nationalism, but this is something we could talk about further uh, in the uh, session number two, I guess, right? Uh, and it is a really time to wrap up this session number one, uh, first session. And uh, I just wanna say thank you all for the contribution you've just made through presentation and, and, and discussion. And I'm pretty sure just like, just like I said before, we can continue our discussions later on uh, this uh, workshop. And, and, and uh, uh, the second uh, session will begin uh, 2.30 in Korean standard time. So if you wanna come and join, please make sure uh, you attend uh, according to your uh, local time zone. So uh, why don't we uh, wrap up here? And once again, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, let's take a break. presentation is entitled Transacculturation Approach to Chinese Y R Theory. I will present the main criticism, criticism of Chinese IRT and also try to import as a response to the criticism. Discuss why Chinese IRT has followed the approach of transacculturation. In the past two decades, basically, Chinese scholars have developed IR theories by drawing on Chinese culture and history. For example, the Tianxia worldview, moral realism, and the relational theory have been published in English roughly around 2015 leading to various discussion in the international relations community in the world. While it is recognized that such theoretical production promotes global international relations, there is criticism. The most serious scholarly criticism is that Chinese IRT follows and reflects cultural essentialism. Indeed, the above mentioned three theories all have borrowed from traditional Chinese thoughts and practices. By cultural essentialism, it means that culture is an essential entity. It is self-organizing, self-standing, and self-fulfilling with its own defining genes, properties, and attributes. It implies even that self-culture is always superior to other cultures. If IR theory takes the approach of cultural essentialism, according to the critics, it will lead to a binary in terms of knowledge production, making it incommunicable and ending in knowledge fragmentation. Some even argue that cultural essentialism may strengthen rather than weaken the already strong Western domination in the IR discourse. The cultural approach leaning heavily towards cultural essentialism is therefore not a correct way to knowledge production. Knowledge is and should be always universal, even though this universality should mean pluralistic universality. Roughly, this is the mainstream criticism of Chinese IRT. Now, let me turn to a question. That is, does Chinese IRT follow cultural essentialism or what I 
term, a culture rich. If you look at the development of Chinese I IT, especially its development in the last two and three decades, we can find three clear phases. First, it was basically a learning period that is in the 1980s and the 90s. Most of the IR classics, largely Western, were translated into Chinese. Learning from and through translation marked the initial theoretical efforts on the Chinese IR community. Then we can see a mixed period of learning and applying. That is, the Chinese IR community tried to utilize the learned theories, including their concepts, theoretical frames, and also methodologies such as testing and so on. Realism, new liberalism, and constructivism have many followers in discussing the contemporary international relations and state behavior. From there, we move to the third phase. That is, some Chinese scholars have tried to develop theories of their own, or developing Chinese or theories. Through drawing on traditional cultural and philosophical ideas, and at the same time, digesting and criticizing Western IR theory. The third phase has happened mainly the last two decades. This learning, utilizing, generating process largely reflects the trajectory of the Chinese IRT in the past 40 years. It is more a process of acculturation than cultural essentialism. It is more a process of inter trans acculturation than an insistence on cultural insertions. In this way, for me, transculturation is a meaningful approach to the development of Chinese IRT, and perhaps to the production of knowledge in the non-Western, usually marginal parts of the world, where knowledge production is concerned. Now let me turn to is trans acculturation. Here we need to define culture first. What is culture? Culture is shared background knowledge. Background knowledge is from an own practice of a community and which is usually inarticulate. At the same time, we have representational knowledge which is articulate, is reflective, and is generated through the reflective human mind. Theories belong to representational knowledge. IR theory definitely belongs to this category. However, we need to understand representational knowledge represents, in the first place, the background knowledge means that theory represents the reflect background knowledge, thus by definition, it is local and is locally produced. If culture is defined in terms of shared background knowledge, then representation of knowledge is rooted in background knowledge or in culture. We can see this diagram. This shows cultures are becoming my mutuality, my, my interaction, self culture, and other culture. They meet, they interact, they commu communicate, and they can even form co culture. Then, acculturation is just such a process in which one culture or the self culture and other culture interact. They cut into each other and influence each other, forming something as co-cultures are mentioned, 
If culture provides the background knowledge for social theory, cultural neutrality provides dynamics for theoretical innovation. But acculturation is a process. It can have a few different shapes. The first I would like to call one-way acculturation means the self-culture influences unilaterally the other culture, as shown in this diagram. But then we have inter-acculturation. That is, two cultures interact, they influence each other at a more physical and visible level. We can see this diagram. They interact, but they do not penetrate into the core. For example, the genes represent the culture of the United States, but it may go to Japan, go to China, China, go to Korea. But this is more at the physical and visible level. The Chinese, the Japanese, and the Koreans wear genes. And then we have trans acculturation. That is, two cultures interact, penetrate, and influence each other. At the metaphysical level, they go into each other's core. And this is the becoming effect. The two cultures are not mutually exclusive. They are, in fact, inclusive of each other. So we can see this flow from one way of acculturation to interculturation to trans acculturation through interpracticality and based upon this we may produce new representational knowledge or theory by combining elements from different cultures in this way we can see in terms of knowledge production one way acculturation is seen in the learning period and the influence is unilateral. Interculturation occurs when the two begin to influence each other, but such influence may not lead to generation of new representational knowledge. When trans acculturation occurs, it may create the becoming effect and the new representational knowledge is produced through mutuality and interpracticality. Now let me move to the approach of transfer acculturation, how we do it, how we approach it, uh, uh, how, how, how we access it. I think there are a few steps which are important. First, identify new ideas in different background knowledges, self and other cultures, and relate these core concepts in representational knowledges. Second, is to find differences in such ideas and concepts by strategic cultural essentialism. Here I borrow the term strategic cultural essentialism from Piatri Spivak when she discusses uh, uh, feminism. He used this term to indicate that some gender essentialism is necessary if the weaker gender wants to change its fate and status. Otherwise, it is completely marginalized, overwhelmed, and silenced. Nobody hears you and nobody pays any attention to you. The absence of different meaning concerning key concepts in the representational knowledge rooted in one in another culture background should be made outstanding, should be demarginalized, and should be articulated. This is the strategy of cultural essentialism. Strategically, we take culture as an essential entity to contribute new ideas and concepts that have never heard or never paid sufficient attention to in the other culture. We may produce now theory relying on the self-culture for strategic purposes. For we need to be present and heard. For our theory need to be joined, 
need to join the global dynamic discourse of our knowledge needs to be global in genuine term. We compare such ideas and concepts, then we enter the process of transculturation. Finally, we generate new representational knowledge or theory. For me, through a Jungian dialectic. What do we mean by Jungian dialectic? That is always belief in complementation and a combination of different themes. So it is, after all, strategic. I mean, the essentialism, cultural essentialism is strategic. Once concepts and ideas are made present, heard, discussed, and debated over. We need to go beyond cultural essentialism and compare such ideas and concepts across cultures. This is when we enter the process of deep transculturation. We are moving towards new representational knowledge and will destroy completely the binary of knowledge structure between the East and West, South and North, core and periphery. In the final analysis, cultural essentialism is strategically adopted during a certain period of transculturation and is to eliminate eventually cultural essentialism. Otherwise, there would be only Western cultural essentialism pretending to be universal and facing no challenge at all. I do have a uh, case in question, that is relationality and rationality. I put them together, call it relational rationality. Rationality is and has been a key concept in the Western social as well as the natural sciences. It has, ne it has even replaced the God to be the Almighty. However, it has never occupied such a glorious position in the Chinese culture. At the same time, relationality has been so conspicuous in the Chinese culture and society. To some extent, relationality to Chinese society, society. is rationality to Western society. society. However, it is largely silenced in knowledge production in the West. It is therefore necessary to practice strategically cultural essentialism to make this key concept outstanding and significant. Otherwise, rationality as the God stands below and above. But all these two concepts, rationality and relationality, mutually exclusive? Perhaps not. It is more useful and practical to combine the two rather than to separate them, to see them as mutually inclusive rather than mutually exclusive. Thus, we may have a new concept, relational rationality, meaning rationality is defined in terms of relationality. But first of all, the concept, the concept relationality should be made heard and discussed. Logical reasoning and empirical analysis around relational rationality may prove both interesting and enlightening. The process of transculturation may bring them together. I thank you. Right. So uh, let me just, uh, without further ado, let me uh, let me introduce uh, Professor Chan. Professor Chan. Um, right. Uh, yes, uh, Professor uh, Cha Song Chan, who organized this wonderful uh, online conference, is our first speaker. Uh, because Professor Un has already introduced Professor Chan this morning, so I will only uh, introduce him very briefly, and also to save time for presentations and discussions. Professor Chan is a professor of international theory at Seoul National University. International uh, theory at uh, Seoul National University, and is also acting as the president of the Korean Association of International Relations. Professor Chan will speak about theorizing North East Asian 
international relations and the case of inter-Korean relations. And right, so can you, could you start uh, your presentation, Professor Chan? Well, as a, one of the organizers, I tend not to be a part of the presenters, but I had to for various reasons. And uh, Professor Eun uh, gave us a very good subject for the whole conference. So my subject, I've been working on this, you know, how to theorize Northeast Asian international relations. And if you look at the case of inter-Korean relations, especially North Korean nuclear problem, then we can connect uh, these two different issues, how to look at North Korean nuclear issues from regional point of view, which uh, lead us to the issue of uh, global IR theorizing. So my idea is that if we want to theorize non-Western, uh, especially Northeast Asian international relations, we have to look at a very distinctive features of the organizing principle in this region, meaning that what are the basic unit of analysis, which is nation state, but it is an accepted idea from the West uh, through the mechanism of imperialism. So before we accept so-called the Westphalian system, we have lived under a very different organizing principle, which is imperial uh, in East Asia. It is a Sinocentric uh, order, which is uh, imperial order. In the process of modern transition, several states end up uh, with succeeding in creating some complete sovereign state. But in, if you look at Northeast Asia, there are many difficulties in accomplishing the status of complete sovereign state because China and Korea are divided. And Japan, as a defeated country in the Pacific War, uh, now try to have the status of so-called normal state. So we can uh, you know, expect that the current status is abnormal or not normal uh, because of you know, the mechanism of post-war arrangement. So uh, how can we connect this uh, very specific situation uh, composed of incomplete sovereign states in this region? And what are the, uh, the concrete issues uh, such as North Korean nuclear problems? So my tentative argument is that North Korea developed nuclear weapons for various reasons, such as domestic reasons or you know, scientific reasons, many reasons, but basically they want to continue or solidify their status as a sovereign state, which is not guaranteed by international society yet. Uh, even though North Korea entered into the United Nations as a regular member in 1991 with South Korea. So formally, or in terms of juridical sense, North Korea was recognized as a sovereign state. But still, uh, there is a sense that uh, North Korea might be uh, incorporated or reunified with South Korea in the future. And even though these are South and North Korea's are two sovereign states, but international society would agree to the idea that because these two countries have lived as one country for more than 1,000 years. So the unification is acceptable, uh, even in terms of you know Westphalian order. So that means North Korea is quite much afraid of being observed by uh, economically very rich and diplomatically a very strong South Korea. That uh, led North Korea just after the end of Cold War uh, to the project of developing North Korean uh, nuclear weapons, which is now uh, very powerful, to, powerful enough to attack the mainland uh, United States, which creates a lot of problem. So uh, it appears that North Korean nuclear problem is a security problem, but fundamentally it's a very political problem, which uh, evolves from the very uh, long time ago, uh, from 19th century in, in terms of the modern transition of the whole regional order. So how to relate these issues and how to develop uh, you know, theorizing the regional uh, international relations from this point. So the first idea, how sovereign are non-Western countries? You know, uh, 
components of sovereignty, as we all know, are territory, nation, and effective and inclusive government. So many countries in non-Western regions have a juridical or formal sovereignty. Uh, so nobody doubts that. But if you look at the real nature of a sovereign state, there are a lot of uh, you know, frustrations and dissatisfaction because those units, those countries have their own ideas traditionally perceived. So my, my country should be like this and this. My country should have uh, this range of territory, uh, this range of nationality. But uh, during the times of imperial, uh, you know, period, uh, they end up with a divided or, uh, you know, shrinked or abnormal type of components of sovereignty. So in their subjective minds, in their uh, perceived, uh, you know, blueprint, they have different ideas of uh, what their sovereign state should be. So uh, there is ongoing game or ongoing uh, political struggle to make their country uh, as a real sovereign state as they imagine uh, they should be. So uh, still, there is an underlying process of making sovereign states complete, uh, which is very distinct in this region, Northeast Asia. Uh, and also, the countries outside of this non-Western region, if you look at Northeast Asia, intra-region states such as China, Korea and Japan are there, but also extra regional strong powers such as United States and Russia, uh, they intervene very frequently and they make full use of this uh, kind of you know, unsatisfactory status of incomplete sovereign states. Uh, for example, you know, United States and Russia can uh, pursue two Korea policy or two China policy, or they can make full use of abnormal status of Japan. So there is an interplay between intra-regional incomplete sovereign states versus very powerful outside extra-regional great power. So if you look at Northeast Asia, we witness the imbalances between nation and state. Uh, for example, if you look at South Korea, you know, in our constitution, we define uh, the range of territory which includes North Korea. So there is a big gap. Our subjective definition of our state and nation uh, with the current status of South Korea, which is limited to uh, half of the Korean Peninsula. And territory and state, normal and abnormal. So anyway, uh, for the interest of time, uh, the argument is that Northeast Asian countries, uh, those five units, uh, you know, North Korea and Taiwan, they are uh, doing, conducting some sovereignty game which cannot be captured by the Western mainstream international relations theory, because all international relations theory start with the idea that uh, international relations are based on sovereign states. It's anarchy. There is no supranational uh, authority to govern interplay among the complete sovereign states. So uh, there are some efforts by uh, theorists such as Kressner and David Lake they said that there is a hierarchy or there is some organized uh, elements of hypocrisy in nation state system. But they presuppose that uh, there are states anyway, there are sovereign states anyway, in the process of uh, you know, interaction among sovereign states because of probably imbalance of power, uh, we now witness the uh, hypocritical hypocritical relations among big powers and small powers, some, uh, you know, conventions, some negotiations to, uh, you know, uh, concede some sovereign rights to great powers, that's West, uh, weak powers, uh, foreign policy. Lake, uh, it defines hierarchical relations, but they do not really theorize how uh, non-Western countries are really uh, incomplete in their sovereignty. And then uh, we have to theorize the whole picture, whole global picture in which, you know, complete sovereign state and non-complete, non-complete uh, sovereign states interact with each other. Uh, so probably we, we need some distinction. And if we have incomplete sovereign state, you know, the elites or leaders of those incomplete sovereign states pursue uh, the foreign policy which goes for the completing 
the sovereign components of, of their state, which makes their foreign policy sometimes very assertive. Uh, then, you know, the agenda of sovereignty game always dominate the domestic agenda, such as you know, domestic democratization. So if you look at China, and even uh, for South Korea, the unification agenda, you know, uh, predominates all other domestic uh, political agendas. So we have to unify, then we have to defer or postpone uh, the project of democratization. That is a very convenient uh, excuse for the authoritarian elites to uh, delay the democratization. But South Korea democratized in spite of those, you know, uh, pitfalls. But China, I think, uh, they are still making use of this sovereignty game to continue their uh, authoritarian political system to some degree. And also, uh, in terms of emotional aspect, there is a persistent antagonism among these incomplete sovereign states in the minds of people. So they are very much frustrated. So they want to continue uh, the sovereignty game. So I'm... Uh, time is quickly running up. So we are not actually making anarchical society. It's anarchical, but there is no social elements because, you know, among incomplete sovereign states, there is a very strong, uh, you know, uh, struggle to uh, have a, you know, upper position in pursuing this game. So I will skip several uh, slides. So sovereignty game and normal international political game. This is theorized by mainstream you know, theories. They want to you know, maximize their powers and interests. Uh, you know, incomplete sovereign states do this normal international political game, but under uh, this game, there is a you know, underlying me uh, mechanism of sovereignty game. So by you know, uh, successfully conducting this international political game, they want to achieve their goals of sovereignty game. How can we uh, more easily uh, you know, achieve the proposals of sovereignty, such as reunification or normalization of their states. So, if we, if if they can maximize their powers, then they have, they are in a better position to pursue uh, the proposals of the sovereignty game. Then North Korea. Uh, well, North Korea was in a very fragile position just after the end of Cold War in 1991, just 30 years ago. Uh, we succeeded in making a the basic agreements with North Korea, uh, making North Korea conform to international norms, such as peaceful coexistence. And there was a strong support by United States because uh, United States unipolarity just started. So structurally, South Korea was in a very uh, you know, beneficial position and North Korea was in a, uh, they are experiencing some existential threat. Uh, and then uh, after, you know, uh, just the end of the Cold War for the last 30 years during the post-Cold War U.S. unipolarity period, North Korea is in a, a very a diff difficult position. You know, uh, just after 9-11, the, I mean, the Bush administration called North Korea as the excess of evil without uh, really you know, solid, uh, uh, you know, some documentations or evidence or some logic. So North Korea is really perplexed by this uh, definition. And then uh, North Korea should search for the way to uh, continue their existence as a member of international society. Even though they became a member of United Nations, politically and diplomatically, they were in a very difficult position because United States antagonized North Korea and South Korea was, uh, you know, a very much uh, dominant uh, in terms of, you know, power balance. So North Korea uh, was in a very difficult position. And uh, as I said, uh, because international society implicitly acknowledges that there is a agenda of unification, so there should be some uh, policy measures for North Korea to guarantee their survival. Uh, and also, they were called as rogue states. So as the U.S.-led liberal international order developed for the last 30 years, uh, you know, U.S.-centered security and economic structure, globalization, all alienated North Korea as isolated country from the international society. Uh, so the only uh, 
effective policy measures for North Korea should be developing North Korean nuclear weapons, which is not really beneficial to their long-term future. But North Korea had to do that. So without, uh, so yeah, that's my 15 minutes. So uh, without persuading North Korea or without guaranteeing North Korea's uh, existence by some measures, it's very hard to solve North Korea's nuclear problem. And uh, I'll skip some of them. And South Korea, as a uh, as a middle country, a middle power country, so mm -hmm. we had to deliver yes. this very mm -hmm. fundamental mm -hmm. logic to international society or United mm -hmm. States that uh, North Korea's nuclear problem springs mm -hmm. from this North Korean problem as a political problem. Mm -hmm. But you know, South Korean mm -hmm. government was not that competent to uh, you know make this logic. So United States actually did not really understand or sympathize with North Korea in uh, looking at the real causes of North Korea's uh, motivation to develop nu uh, nuclear weapons. So I'll go to the last uh, slide. So if we want to solve the North Korean nuclear problem, then uh, there are several ways to go. Uh, the collapse of North Korea, uh, which is not really desirable. And also we uh, can coexistence with North Korea for the long future for gradual peaceful unification or coexistence. Uh, or we can recognize North Korea as a nuclear state. Then uh, probably we can coexist with North Korea if South Korea uh, has the ex <laughs> extended deterrence for the foreseeable future or we uh, alone go nuclear to deter North Korea as any possible attack or complete denuclearization of North Korea. So by uh, combining this uh, military-centered approach, which is complete denuclearization, and by giving them a, uh, you know, uh, some reasonable way to guarantee uh, their uh, security assurance or survival, then uh, we can have a equilibrium, which is peaceful coexistence with denuclearize North Korea, but with a security guarantee, not just from South Korea, but from the United States. But again, uh, without understanding the whole logic of regional Northeast Asia international relations and uh, giving a very good idea of the, you know, the particularity of this logic to the United States or international society, it's very hard to solve a uh, North Korean nuclear problem. Okay, let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chan, for your very uh, insightful paper. Professor Chan, as has as he has confessed uh, at the beginning of uh, his talk, and as I as I have been looking at him, has been working on this theme of formulating an alternative theory of international relations based on East Asian history after the Second World War. Your suggestion to employ the concept of incomplete sovereignty to theorize North Asian relations is very persuasive and, and in particular as it differs from the Chinese school which tends to concentrate on recovering Tianxia system or the traditional Chinese imperial system of regional order. But uh, my question will be whether both South and North Korea want is complete sovereignty and are we not going back to the Western notion of complete sovereignty which Japan had already successfully and influentially adopted? and how your definition of incomplete sovereignty contributes to revising the traditional or Western or American dominant theory of international relations when it already has a very clear idea of the hierarchy of power between states and how it functions. But uh, that's, uh, that's just my minor quibble to your uh, uh, very persuasive and insightful uh, suggestion of uh, using incomplete uh, sovereignty to solve the problems of the uh, South Korean uh, 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 relationship. And because uh, Professor Christensen uh, uh, of University of Copenhagen is missing, so we will move on to Professor Vikasana's paper. Are, are, is it okay, Professor Yes, that's, yes that's fine. Uh, uh, can, I, can I just introduce you to our uh, participants? before you uh, go on to your paper. 
So we have uh, Professor um, Igide Wayu Wikasana at Universitas Erlanga. Dr. Uh, Professor Wikasana is a senior lecturer of international relations in the Department of International uh, Department of International Relations, uh, Faculty of Social and Political Sciences at Erlanga University, Indonesia. He has published uh, widely and in his, his articles appeared in Asian Security, European Journal of East Asian Studies, Journal of International Relations and Development, Asian Politics and Policy, Asian Journal of Political Science, and the Pacific Review, among many others. And Professor Wikasana would talk about uh, Asia, uh, ASEAN in Indonesian IR scholarship. Uh, so please join me to welcome Professor Wikasana. Okay, thanks very much, Professor An and the Institute for uh, giving me the opportunities to uh, present at this very uh, in very good, very interesting uh, academic forum. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Asian in, in Indonesian IR scholarship. Uh, my idea is to advance uh, a kind of, of uh, analytic eclecticism uh, in, in IR theorizing and methodology. Uh, in our successful uh, project of uh, weak state agencies, at the conclusion, uh, Professor Ern. Uh, notes about uh, the needs uh, to become more eclectic, analytic eclectics uh, in <clears throat> addressing theoretical and methodological problems of, of uh, weak state agencies. And I adopt his ideas. Uh, I mix with uh, some uh, knowledge which I have uh, from uh, reading uh, Peter Katzenstein, uh, Rudrasil, uh, and others. And, um, and I try to, to promote this idea uh, and use uh, Indonesian IR scholarship on Asian as, as uh, my point to uh, advance global IR. Um, why talk about Asian and Indonesian IR scholarship? Uh, I, will, I will come uh, next uh, with my argument, but let me give uh, the background. Southeast Asia is, is one of the region which is highly potential to uh, become a source of uh, global IR knowledge. Uh, as uh, Amita Pacharya uh, wrote in, in 2000 about uh, the search for identity, uh, international relations in Southeast Asia, the search for identity, that this region is quite unique. And it's, it's long histories, uh, very strong uh, cultures, diversities in, in ethnic groups, religions, and then political entities make Southeast Asia uh, is a, a, a potential and actual source of knowledge. Uh, some, although, although this is uh, a wealthy uh, region, uh, in terms of, of uh, source of knowledge, but not many scholars are uh, realized uh, these potentials. Uh, in Indonesia, for example, what I'm doing, uh, studying about scholarship, uh, studying about epistemology is not popular because uh, many scholars prefer to uh, apply established theories uh, and uh, develop empirical case for uh, policy recommendations, uh, employing positivist uh, approach, and uh, they develop uh, something like a mainstream IR, uh, based on mainstream IR theories. I tried to, to uh, build something different. Although I'm, I'm learning about uh, the, the, uh, the established theories, uh, realism, British realism, or English school, but uh, I try to criticize them and develop uh, my own perspective based on the Indonesian scholarship. Uh, why uh, looking at Asian and Indonesian IR scholarship? This is, it doesn't mean that uh, other states in Southeast Asia are not uh, potential, but to, to the best of my knowledge, Indonesia has invested uh, 
most of its diplomatic and political resources to found and maintain ASEAN. Independent ASEAN is uh, the cornerstone of Indonesia's foreign policy, and it makes uh, relevant and significant to discuss how Indonesian scholars talk about uh, the origin, uh, development, and future of ASEAN. I propose an argument. Uh, the studies about ASEAN in Indonesian IR uh, has three major components, foreign policy, uh, regionalism, and strategic culture. Uh, these elements do not stand by themselves. They relate to each other to strengthen uh, the explanatory power. Uh, and it appears in, in uh, lots of literature I have researched that uh, there is no single uh, dominant uh, concept uh, which constructs Indonesian uh, scholars' work on Asian. Uh, there must be a combination between foreign policy, regional views, or foreign policy and strategic culture, and so on. Um, However, the development of ASEAN after the Cold War, uh, 20 years of 30 years after the Cold War, and now uh, the changing regional order after the COVID-19, uh, give rise to internal debates among, among the Indonesian IR, IR communities, uh, whether ASEAN should be continually uh, an, the, import, the most important uh, future of Indonesia's foreign policy or uh, post-Asian foreign policy. And from this internal diversity, uh, I, I foster, I, I try to, to promote uh, analytic eclecticism as a prospective approach, uh, both to understand Asian uh, and Indonesian relationship and uh, Asian as a political entity or regional organization which continues to operate in, in the region and in the global politics. Um, my, my argument, I develop this argument uh, in several parts of discussion. I begin by, by underlining why we study Asia for global IR. Asia is the home ground Southeast Asian regional organization. It's, it was founded, it was established in 1967 to uh, promote the five pioneer members, uh, political cultures, uh, norms, and values. Of course, uh, there, is a, there was a, a, the Cold War context which, which uh, uh, allowed Asian to come up, but uh, the evolution of this organization demonstrate that uh, they have tried to uh, elaborate, they have tried to maintain uh, a regional unique identity, which, which is called the Asian way. Uh, compared to the European Union uh, as an, an ideal, ideal uh, type of uh, regionalism, Asian, of course, is not is not ideal. There, there are some some Western critics of Asian. It is not integrated. It is uh, too much uh, dependent on non interference and others. Um, but Asian maintains uh, the Asian way. And if we use if we look at uh, the mainstream IR theories, we can find out weaknesses and limits. Uh, in, in studying ASEAN, uh, the Western structure of IR cannot understand and completely explain why ASEAN can operate, why ASEAN can exist uh, to the prison. Realism even say ASEAN is not an important actor because uh, it's weak. Uh, material powers. Uh, liberalism says that 
uh, ASEAN has uh, a good future, but in fact, ASEAN is not a cosmopolitan uh, regional organization. It doesn't apply uh, liberal values or liberal democracy, uh, free trade, like likewise uh, in in other in, in North America or in Western Europe. Constructivist is okay to explain uh, <clears throat> Asian norms, and English school is good in in understanding uh, how as how Asian can maintains its norm, but the two uh, perspectives uh, lack in understanding why militarism uh, is rising uh, at the moment in, in Asian major countries, in Indonesia, in, in Thailand, in, in the Philippines. Uh, militaristic uh, security policies uh, come up uh, in response to uh, the dynamic of, of uh, regional and the global uh, system. And <clears throat> I argue that we should learn, we should study Asian from inside. Western scholars who combine uh, dominant or, or mainstream IR theories with, with middle range theories uh, usually like to blame on uh, the Asian side or the, the uh, individual uh, Southeast Asian states uh, for uh, their inability, the inability to, to follow in uh, the established uh, values, universal uh, practice, and others. For example, uh, <clears throat> a popular, uh, an outstanding Southeast Asian uh, analyst who tries to explain why democracy cannot work well in Southeast Asia. Uh, he based on uh, modern political theory, European political theory, and combine the approach with uh, local cultures. And the conclusion is Asian cannot, or Asian is not good at making democracy or Asian policy making is not democratic because of they, and democratic political culture. It is unfair because uh, Western scholars like to use their own perspective, own uh, regional experience, cultures to understand other regions, other cultures and other countries. I do not say that we have to discard or we have to eliminate uh, Western theories uh, from the literature on Southeast Asia, but we have to develop, to rebalance, we have to rebalance uh, the dominant knowledge by promoting local perspectives and approaches to study ASEAN. Uh, of course, there are 10 potential resources of knowledge uh, from each Asian members. And I have explained uh, the reason why I, I, I focus on Indonesia. And this is not popular in, in, in even in my Indonesian IR communities to, to do this uh, kind of uh, epistemological project. But it's okay. Um, <clears throat> how Indonesian scholars study Asia? Uh, parallel to the journey of Asia since 1960s to 1990s, uh, three perspectives uh, had been developed. Uh, foreign policy, uh, Indonesian scholar link the establishment of Asian to their country's foreign policy, uh, the independent and active. Regionalism uh, means that uh, Indonesia needs uh, stability, uh, peace and development in Southeast Asia to support its its uh, existence and <clears throat> its role in, in, in the region and, and the global and, 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 and international politics at large. Uh, strategic culture, uh, nationalism matters. Indonesian uh, experience history as a, as a colonized country matters. Uh, it makes Indonesia uh, mostly inward looking uh, in has mistrust 
uh, to its neighboring countries, although although ASEAN is its its uh, closest neighbors and its cornerstone of the foreign policy, but Indonesia Indonesian elites uh, up to now have never trust never trusted uh, their neighbor fully. Uh, this is why ASEAN always uh, relies on non-interference and uh, observing the development of the literature. Uh, these three elementary concepts uh, have been uh, combined uh, in, in, in discussing, in, in studying about ASEAN. And following the collapse of Cold War system in Southeast Asia, the scholarship become more interdisciplinary. Economists uh, and uh, sociologists and other other scholars uh, contribute to, to the study of ASEAN, even from the strategic studies, the military uh, scholars uh, contributed to develop Indonesian uh, Asian, Asian studies. And this interdisciplinary opens a debate on whether Indonesia needs to continue uh, working with Asia. It happens over the last 15 years, especially when Indonesia failed to, to, um, to make its ideas about uh, Asian community uh, to, uh, to save Asian as uh, a community uh, imagined by Indonesia. Between 2004 and 2010, Indonesia was involved in, in making uh, how Asian in the future is like. Indonesia wanted that Asian must be uh, a universal, uh, universally driven uh, organization. It, it applies to universal norms. It complies to uh, the global uh, practice, but other Asian members rejected. And the result of, of the uh, disagreements among Asian is uh, Asian community as we see now. It is not uh, fully uh, a security community as uh, conceptualized by the Western scholars, and there are more uh, influences from local uh, political and cultural uh, ideas. So, um, dis disappoint disappointed by, by this development, some scholars in Indonesia started to talk about post-Asian foreign policy. Indonesia doesn't really need Asian. Uh, Indonesia can even expand its regional role beyond Asia. And uh, this, this argument is mostly supported by uh, realist-oriented uh, <clears throat> realist scholars who want Indonesia to look back to its uh, nature, national uh, power and develop uh, alignment with a bigger power. Japan, India, uh, China, Australia, even with the US. Uh, they mostly support East Asia summit uh, instead of ASEAN and other, uh, other kinds of, of uh, cross-regional uh, institutions. But the Asian apologists say that Indonesia cannot leave Asia because uh, they have so, much, so many complementarities. And COVID-19 brings a whole atmosphere of debates between these two poles of uh, scholarship who, the, the, who agrees and disagrees about uh, Asian future in Indonesia's foreign policy. It is not conclusive up to now. And uh, learning from these national diversities, uh, I try to understand that it is not necessary to take a position uh, 
either agree or disagree, but we have to develop something which is uh, more Indonesian and more Southeast Asian. Uh, and how to do this? Uh, thanks to the uh, analytic eclecticism paradigm in, in, in IR, which allows us to, um, to make interaction cross uh, perspective interaction uh, to try to promote uh, even contending uh, positions to resolve a problem, uh, problem solving oriented uh, approach and unprivileging a particular concept. Positivist theories and uh, scholars like to privilege a particular theory, but in analytic eclectic approach, uh, we have to treat all theories fairly. Uh, this this kind of approach is not is not easy to to accept. Uh, uh, I understand, uh, especially for for those who who use methodology very strictly, but. For the reason of advancing global IR, it gives larger space to insert uh, local knowledge, to appreciate local knowledge and use them as the basis to uh, promote Indonesian or Southeast Asian perspective on Asia. What I have done is to, to uh, use Indonesian familial culture to understand Asian norms. Uh, although this this uh, this familial culture is not a purely Indonesian, it's it's appeared in in most countries of Southeast Asia. But there is coherent patterns of of norms between the local ethnic groups practice and the Asian norms, and this is it is a good sign of of. Um, uh, developing local sources of knowledge for, for uh, Southeast Asian studies. And in, in my last, uh, in my latest uh, article published in the Pacific Review, I, I underscore the importance to see hedging, uh, which is a, a well established concept of weak power agency. Uh, to see hedging is, uh, is not like what, uh, Majority scholars see as a risk-taking uh, strategy, but hedging is a plural, an order pluralizing strategy, and uh, this is kind of this is a, a global IR to, to my mind. And um, I conclude uh, by by uh, suggesting that uh, analytic eclecticism. It's a prospective approach, although it is still uh, controversial uh, in terms of, of uh, operationalization and, 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 um, and its application. Uh, I, I, will, I will understand if, if uh, there will be many critics uh, to this uh, uh, approach, but in fact, in our Asian scholarship, Indonesian scholars have actually applied an eclectic approach uh, in understanding and explaining uh, Asian. Uh, Asian as, a, as, an inter, as a regional organization and uh, Indonesian foreign policy as an individual member state of the uh, organization. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your attention to my presentation. Critics and comments are most welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Wikasana, for your presentation. And uh, in order to uh, take global IR seriously, I think it is of vital importance to look into and explore various ways in which IR have been developed in different parts of the world. And uh, as I understand it, uh, the second session of this workshop is dedicated to uh, for that purpose. And in this respect, Professor Wikasana's paper explains explaining the three conceptual components of the 
in Indonesian ASEAN scholarship, foreign policy, regionalism, and strategic culture is a valuable uh, contribution to that aspect of uh, global IR. But I still have a suspicion, probably because of my sheer ignorance of contemporary international studies, whether uh, global IR is a mere jumble of national ways of explaining their different situations. And um, I think it is one thing to criticize the Western mainstream IR for parochialism, but to develop an alternative theory of international relations needs much more sophisticated and systematic uh, thinking. But, uh, but, but while listening to uh, Professor Wikasana's presentation, I'm convinced that we are slowly moving in the uh, right direction. So um, moving on to uh, uh, Professor Eun Su's paper, uh, and it seems that uh, Professor Christensen uh, from Copenhagen is not able to join us, yes. Right, so we are moving on to uh, Professor Eun Young Su's paper. So our final speaker is Professor Eun, another of our two organizers. Uh, professor Eun is Professor of Political Science and International Studies at Hanyang University, Seoul. And he's the editor-in-chief of the Lautlich series, IR Theory and Practice in Asia. Eun Young Su received his PhD from University of Warwick He's interested in IR theory, pluralism in international studies, global IR, and identity studies, among many others. He's the editor of Going Beyond Parochialism and Fragmentation in International Studies, uh, which appeared from Lautlich in 2020, and the author of Pluralism and Engagement in the Discipline of International Relations uh, from Palgrave in 2016. Professor Eun also has many uh, articles published in such journals as Global Studies Quarterly, International Studies Perspective, Perspectives on Politics, and Review of International Studies. So uh, Professor Eun, can you start? And because uh, we are missing two speakers, we have plenty of time, I think, to uh, discuss. So you can take your time to present your uh, paper uh, uh, in detail. <laughs> Right. Uh, first of all, thank you, Professor An, for your kind introductions. I'm flattered. <laughs> uh, as you know from the title of this, uh, this presentation or paper, uh, I'm going to talk about the global IR uh, from the perspective of uh, Asia. Uh, obviously, uh, my talk, uh, my paper, does not represent a total view of Asian IR scholarships, uh, but I guess it could be used as uh, one of the useful points of reference that we could take uh, for making sense of where we stand in terms of the practice, actual practice of global IR uh, in Asian IR communities. Um, obviously, a uh, question then is, uh, why am I interested in this kind of, this particular uh, question or, or issue? That is simply because uh, it's, been, it's been quite a while, as you, as you know. I mean, over the past 15 to 20 years, at least, uh, we IL scholars, especially those working on or living in Asia or interested in Asian international relations uh, or Asian regionalism, regional politics, uh, have, have paid great attention to uh, the problem of the West centrism, uh, of the discipline, uh, therefore calling for uh, the broadening, uh, the theoretical, conceptual, and epistemological horizons of the study of international relations. So a few scholars today will dispute the importance of uh, the projects such as Global uh, IR. Um, of course, Global IR uh, has its own critics, uh, that's for sure. But there is a clear intention uh, shared by both advocates and critics, which is to promote greater diversity in IR theory I am knowledge production by embracing wide range of history or perspectives 
and experiences, particularly those uh, from outside Anglo-American or Anglo-European uh, core of the West. Uh, question, a key question then becomes is whether and to what extent our constant long lasting call that have been going on for like 20 years uh, for greater diversity have actually been realized, especially here in Asian IR communities. Uh, to answer this important question, I have examined uh, with the help from my colleague working at Fudan University in Shanghai, China, a set of data gathered from uh, three recent sources, right? Uh, first, teaching, research, and international policy project, which is led by the College of William Mary in the United States. And second, uh, China's leading IL journals. And third, a series of surveys of uh, Asian IL scholars. So let me present the findings of this multifaceted investigation into the practice of global IR in Asian IR communities, okay? First, a trip. Uh, as you know, trip surveys uh, every two to three years, right? Uh, IELTS scholars around the world uh, in order to find out a trend, research or teaching trends uh, in the discipline of IR. And back in 2017, they surveyed IELTS scholars more than 36, 30 countries, including Asian countries, of course, such as Japan and Singapore and Hong Kong, Taiwan. And it's finding clearly uh, demonstrate uh, that more than 60% of uh, Asian IELTS scholars survey by this trip uh, approach international relations issues and questions with the uh, one of the three uh, Western drive mainstream traditional uh, IL theories such as realism, liberalism and conventional constructivism as you can see in this table uh, one. And this particular theoretical preference or theoretical trend is uh, uh, does uh, corresponds uh, quite well to their preference or a commitment to positivism as a epistemological foundation upon which to base their uh, analysis, right? Again, as you can see in this table uh, to a majority of the survey scholars go for positivism as opposed to post-positivism. And what about, what about China? Um, uh, this trip survey does not include Chinese IL scholarship. And so is it China or Chinese IL community different? I mean, there have been, as you know, substantial attempts by Chinese IL scholars to develop so-called homegrown indigenous Chinese IL theories. Uh, but the uh, findings of a content analysis uh, of uh, Chinese IELTS uh, articles published in these four leading Chinese IL journals over the past 10 years uh, show to us that there is a clearly uh, a similar pattern there, uh, at least when it comes to theoretical research uh, by Chinese IL scholars, because uh, more than 70% uh, of the articles published in these journals fit within, again, three uh, positivist traditional uh, IL theories, particularly uh, realist balance of power theory and power transition theory, followed by liberalism, uh, rational or rationalist institutionalism and conventional constructivism, which uh, focuses on uh, social norms and social institution. So these findings sort of indicate that intellectual resources, conceptual philosophical resources uh, underpinning uh, homegrown indigenous Chinese style theories have yet to make a significant impact on how Chinese scholars conceptualize or theorize how the world works, uh, past, present, even possible uh, futures. And then what about uh, other Asian IELTS communities? Are they different? Uh, not really because uh, there is a clearly uh, lack, clear lack of attention to alternative critical indigenous science studies 
uh, in other Asian IL communities, including South Korea, Vietnam, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Cambodia. Um, more specifically, uh, in the 2019 survey of all members of the Korean International Studies Association who also teach IR or conduct IR research here in South Korea, 65% said they approach international relations with one of the, again, one of the three positivist Western drive traditional IR theories, whereas less than 7% is committed to employing or developing critical IL theories or post-colonial IL theories or perspectives, which are very attentive to local uh, history or local philosophies. Uh, however, uh, this particular theoretical research trend does not quite correspond to South Koreans South Korea IL scholars recognition of the problem of West centrism in, in the discipline because almost all 99% of Korean IL scholars problematize IL as a Western dominated enterprise. And even 90% supported the development of an indigenous Korean style IL theory as a way out. Um, and much the same can be said about other Asian, Southeast Asian IL communities. Because um, when asked which IL theory best describes your approach to the study of international relations in surveys of IL scholars based in these five countries, more than 70% on average chose, again, one of the three conventional positivist style theories whereas less than 10% deploy alternatives, including critical theories of post-colonialism sensitive to local perspectives or local experiences. And however, just like the Korean case before, uh, more than 90% agree that it is very important or somewhat important to develop an IL theory based on indigenous culture or historical experiences of Asia as a way of doing global IR or as a way of promoting greater diversity uh, in IL theory or knowledge uh, production. And here are more detailed numbers and figures of, of, of the survey that I just introduced to you. So as you can see in this table three, overwhelming majority of Asian IL scholars survey are supportive of global IR, are supportive of the development of non-Western IR theorization uh, with the uh, uh, agreement that IL is a Western dominated enterprise. However, still a few uh, Western drive uh, mainstream, uh, uh, the traditional positivist IL theories remain dominant influences across these Asian IR communities, right? Uh, so although the West centrism has long been criticized and therefore global IR, non-Western IR theory building enterprises have received a lot of attention and endorsements by uh, Asian IR scholarship, still we have not yet to go beyond the problem of West centrism. Um, on top of that, there is no single theoretical perspective that dominates Asian IL communities. As you can see here, there are three mainstream theoretical perspectives, but there is only one epistemology underlining these uh, theoretical perspectives, which is a uh, uh, positivism. So one of the clear implications of this investigation is that Western dominance or Western centrism can be seen in the, uh, the dominance of positivism, which is a particular version of science that originated in the modern uh, West. And even those who wanna go beyond uh, West centrism of the discipline 
uh, by developing indigenous style theories or concepts tend to do so on the basis of a general acceptance of the positivist model of model of science. Uh, they tend to they tend to consider positivism as a standard or as a universal way of doing IAM. For instance, Yan Xietong, who is a well-known figure, not only in China, but also worldwide, as a contributor to the development of indigenous Chinese IELTS theory, emphasizes the importance of scientific approaches, uh, which he defined in positive terms. Because uh, he, by saying that Chinese IELTS theory must seek universality in order to be recognized as a scientific enterprise. And the same line of thinking is commonly found here in South Korea as well, because uh, any theorizing based on unique experiences of Korea must be tested under the principle of generality. This is a kind of thinking or statement we could commonly uh, come across when it comes to uh, Korean IL development enterprises. So in this sense, I believe the problem of West centrism is synonymous with the problem of the dominance of positivism. And as you know, positivism as a particular philosophy of science, as a particular version of science, does not accept local perspectives or indigenous experiences as a secure foundation on which to produce or ensure any scientific knowledge. Uh, quite the opposite is the case because that in positivist conception of science, it is unscientific to empathize particular culture or try to incorporate a particular uh, worldview or philosophy into theorization precisely because a legitimate scientific theory should be able to demonstrate universality general applicability. So any attempt from this perspective, from the perspective of positivism, any attempt to develop indigenous theory attentive to local culture or local history is suspect because it can delimit the general applicability of that, uh, that theory. And this has uh, significant implications as far as I'm concerned, because it implies that our attempts to globalize or pluralize IA by theorizing non-Western or Asian uh, countries or societies, indigenous uh, culture or histories uh, have to be accompanied by attempts to broaden what we mean by scientific knowledge in IA, unless we address uh, this mistaken conflation of science in general uh, with the particular version of science, you know, for example, positivist version of science, the parochialism of IR will likely remain unchanged. So I argue uh, that's one of the key points that I want to make clear today, which is the what is at stake in global IR is not only greater theoretical diversity in geocultural sense, but also more crucially, a pluralistic understanding of what it means to be scientific, therefore legitimate and valid knowledge uh, in the discipline. So in this sense, I argued the, the advocates of global IR or non-Western IR theorization projects uh, need to change their geography-oriented understanding of the discipline or geography-oriented approaches to the problem of West centrism and instead try to create solidarity with other critical scholars, particularly post-positivist scholars in order to build wide avenue in which not only positivist inferences, but also normative theorizing and ethnographically attuned approaches are all accepted as different, but equally valid, equally scientific ways of doing IR. And here I suggest as a method, uh, autobiography or autoethnographical approach to the practice of global IR, because I do believe uh, it is a useful and powerful tool for creating and forging solidarity and even empathy among marginalized scholars and underrepresented 
uh, voices. Mm. As a matter of fact, to reveal the personal, you know, to reveal um, personal experiences, you know, personal encounters, personal uh, struggles, personal challenges should be the very first step in creating solidarity with, with others. So whenever, whenever we tell our personal stories, like the uh, struggles and challenges we have had, when we try to do IL differently, when we try to do uh, the promotion of greater diversity in the discipline of IR and the associated emotions that we have felt and other marginalized voices and scholars, regardless of their uh, geocultural, geopolitical locations can always find threads of their own stories in ours. And I believe that recognition becomes the basis for the solidarity needed to create a more diverse and broader uh, I am. So to rebuild the feeling self is an effective way to uh, find links with others across various social political uh, boundaries. Uh, so uh, I argue this is the second main point that I want to make clear today. Uh, by, by engaging more actively with this, or what I call autobiographical solidarity, with the aim of opening up broad avenues for validating different ways of doing IR or different ways of uh, producing scientific knowledge in IR, we can then make progress towards a genuine opening up of the discipline uh, to alternative uh, voices. Uh, this is a pretty much that uh, I wanna I wanna share with you today. So uh, I'm gonna leave it there. Uh, thank you for uh, listening. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Un, for your uh, wonderful paper uh, using a data survey of IR scholars in Asia from South Korea, Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, the Philippines, and to Cambodia. Professor Un, you has ascertained the widespread and growing desire among us uh, for an alternative uh, critical theory of international relations, which will compete, if not replace the dominant Western triangle theories of realism, liberalism, and constructivism. But again, as in the case of Professor Kasana's paper, I'm, I'm playing the devil's advocate here, but I'm, I'm worried whether we are throwing the baby out of the bathwater when we call for a pluralistic understanding of what it means to be scientific. And it's not the concept of theory itself, uh, Western. And you suggested an autobiographical approach as a way out from the Western dominated IR field. But I wonder, it can be degenerated into an outlet of defending different national interests and perspectives. So that's uh, my uh, uh, critical questions. And we have, I think we have about 30 minutes uh, for uh, discussion. So we have Peter here, right? Uh, yes, uh, Peter, uh, Professor Christensen is finally here. So uh, then, we can have your presentation, right? Uh, that's that's uh, that's that's great. Uh, let me just introduce you, and you will have uh, maximum twenty minutes to present your paper. So our uh, final speaker is Dr. Peter Christensen from Denmark. He's associate professor of political science at the University of Copenhagen. His research uh, rise at the intersection of the sociology of knowledge, international relations theory, and emerging powers. His most recent project, States of Emergency, explored historical knowledge about power transitions and rising powers. His research has been widely uh, uh, appeared in such journals as European Journal of International Relations, International Theory, International Studies Perspectives, and Review of International Political Economy. So please uh, join me to welcome Professor Christensen from Denmark. Um, sorry, I'm, uh, I apologize very much for being late. Um, I don't wanna go too much into details, but uh, I had to suddenly rush into the office to get a charger and um, 
find someone to take care of the kids. But uh, in the meantime, but it, it worked, it worked out. <laughs> the kids are safe. So, uh, <laughs> and I'm here. Um, so, um, yeah, my presentation is called uh, Beyond a More International IR. And I think actually it's uh, the, the conclusion uh, by, by Professor Un um, really uh, fits very well into this because it's, it's, it's also a critique of the geocentrism in this debate, that it's all about geographical variation and, uh, and what essentially what the conclusion of, of, of your paper was that it's what we end up then with is geographical variation in a, in a positivist prison uh, and maybe not that much variation anyway. Um, because it's still the dominant version of what science is and what IR is that, that mm -hmm. prevails. Um, this paper takes a very different uh, approach to, uh, to the question of, of this global turn in IR. So I'm sure you're all here very much familiar with this. I'm not sure it's convention to call it a global turn per se, but um, everything in IR these days, if it's new, it's called a turn. So we can call it the global turn, uh, what, what we're doing here. Um, anyway, it comes out of this much longer, it, it's not a new turn as such. Uh, it's this longer critique actually can be traced very, very far back in Western IR's history, that the discipline has been not international enough, that it's been too US centric, later on more Anglo centric, and, and more recently, um, Western centric, and um, and this has led to all these different kinds of, of approaches to making IR more global is now the, the, the preferred term. But of course, it initially it was um, calling for third world R, IR to to come to the fore. There was also a period of perhaps ten years or so where non Western IR was was the preferred term. That has certainly fallen for, from grace um, and has a lot of problems, of course. Um, um, but of course, it's still it's still a useful rhetorical move uh, in order to position uh, what you do as something very different from Western IR, peripheral IR, and and global IR. So it it has a lot of labels, but in, in essentially the 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 project. And it consists of, of some different projects, of course, but the project of making IR more global and less uh, US Western centric. Um, so just to be clear from the beginning, I think this project is, is long overdue. And I, 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 in my own research, very much tried to support this, um, that it, it is actually time to overcome some of these geographical and national parochialisms. However, um, what I'm going to argue today is also that the search for simply more international IR, more IR from different countries, um, has certain limitations. And it also neglects that this project has its own history, its own actually quite troubled history. And it ris risks repeating some of the past failures, sorry, um, of earlier attempts to make IR more global. So, um, what I'm arguing here in this paper, which is co-authored with uh, Arlene Tickner, um, is that the search for more international IR is actually not a new thing. It's arguably, and that's what we're arguing in the paper, constitutive of the discipline's very identity. So it's less known today um, because people tend to think of this as something that started in the uh, maybe late 1990s, early 2000s. But it's, it's less known that IR scholars in the interwar period actually were preoccupied with surveying variations in the ways of knowing IR and teaching IR around the world. So they started doing that already in the 20s and 30s, mostly by Europeans uh, and Americans, as I'll talk more about later. But, but, but this project has a longer history and, and they also wanted to make IR more international in their own way. Um, so that's why we're saying this problem of International IR, the pun is very easy. It's not a very international discipline. It calls itself international, ha, ha, ha. Um, but that problem actually has been very central to its, its discourse since it started institutionalizing, if we buy the argument that it started institutionalizing in the interwar period. So the paper here makes a genealogical intervention. It, it tries to actually show the history, go back and see 
what was also filtered out of, of this making IR more global. Uh, and there are some troubling um, parts of that that were filtered out. Uh, and we do so by revisiting the archives. The first and biggest international IR conferences. It's very Eurocentric. It was, it, it was, uh, took place mostly in, in, in Europe, but um, it actually did try to internationalize. Um, and, um, and so that's where we draw on this argument that it's um, making IR more international is constitutive of, of disciplinary identity understood in the, in the, <clears throat> I think someone needs to turn off. Um, yeah. So we also write into this um, literature on revisionist histories of IR. Um, and, and what the revisionist histories of IR have done so far is that they've challenged the conventional stories about this discipline and how it started in bleak interwar Wales with this big bang first great debate between realism and idealism. A lot of work has been put into that. Uh, in this paper, we don't really challenge that in any way. And we don't really contribute to that either. The second major revision is, is the one here that challenges the noble origins of IR as a discipline established with this lofty purpose of solving the problem of war once and for all after the First World War. That has been really sort of also taken down from the pedestal over the past 10 years. Instead, historical studies have revealed that what you find when you go back to that period is a longer, much more Eurocentric, much more imperialist and racist history. So that's also the context of this paper. When you're doing a genealogical intervention into IR, this is the, also the backdrop. We contribute to this revisionism, but, but, but we focus still on the interwar period. So rather than others who have who've said that, well, we, IR didn't start in the interwar period. We're not saying that it did start, but something did happen. And, and these large uh, conferences that we're looking at are actually quite important even though they are Eurocentric. So the ones we're looking at is, is the conference called the International Studies Conference. So this is a largely neglected phenomenon in international relations history for obvious reasons, as I'll tell you later, because it's not always a very convenient story, but they were arguably the earliest self-conscious reflections on IR as a discipline. So they weren't just policy, uh, conferences. They also studied collective security, uh, problems of raw materials, colonies, uh, peace in Europe, um, and so on. They also had those policy issues. But they, alongside that, they had a series of debates and roundtables uh, titled The University Teaching of International Relations. So they actually started, even though they were geographers, economists, sociologists, political scientists from all kinds of different uh, disciplines. They got together and started talking about what, what is this international relations and how do we teach it and how is it taught around the world? What's already done? What are the main institutions around the world? <clears throat> so in that sense, you get this first attempt to survey what's, what is IR? What is the national variation in IR also? Uh, and the ISC, the International Studies Conference, which was affiliated to the to League of Nations International Committee on Intellectual Cooperation. Um, they also tried to actually promote in the institutionalization of IR in, in different uh, countries around the world. And they organized all these uh, conferences, promoted, published all these books on how IR is done in country X, Y, Z. So we argue that this is actually an important historical dimension of, of this global IR push. It's completely neglected, but it's, it's important to revisit for some obvious reasons, as I'll say later, because it, it failed. Um, so it calls for revisiting, but also for a revisionist history of, of this. And the, here I, I just took a screenshot of one of the documents, which was a whole 1936 uh, conference on uh, the university teaching of international relations, where the discussants, uh, <clears throat> mostly Europeans, were discussing how should we teach IR and you know how should we have chairs, professorships of IR and so on. All these kinds of sometimes quite mundane things about how to structure IR. 
Um, so the broader project they had of making IR more international took place through three different mechanisms that we identify in the discipline, at least three. So one of them was simply this institution building. That was a way of making IR more international because if you establish institutions of IR around the world, and not just national institutions, but also international institutions um, like the International Studies Conference, but there was also the Graduate School in Geneva that they were working with, <clears throat> more international uh, institutions as well. That was one. Uh, I'll get go into more detail with these uh, in a minute. The second one was not so much about institutions, but about a certain internationalist spirit that we have to uh, encourage. That was their argument. So international relations should be different than other disciplines. Other disciplines are nationalist. That's what they said. History is nationalist. Sociology is nationalist. Economics, mostly nationalist, except some work on trade. But all the other disciplines, the social sciences, especially they said, we're trapped within this territorial um, nationalist cage. So we need to promote this internationalist discipline that sort of overcomes nationalism and, and fosters an international mind and eventually uh, peace uh, among nations. This is probably closest to what some might say was the idealist spirit of the interwar period. The third one is, is quite different and it's almost uh, more the realist version of, of global IR, which is to say, no, we shouldn't uh, necessarily promote internationalism, but we should be aware that war arises from a clash between different national perspectives. So we should actually study these different national perspectives. It's important for us to know how Japanese or Russians or Germans or uh, Americans think about international relations because only then can we actually cultivate a reconciliation, a mutual understanding between these different approaches to IR. So those were the three we identified. Just briefly on the institution building, which isn't necessarily the most interesting one, um, but the ISC itself was a way of making IR more international. It actually wanted to be an international association of IR institutions. It didn't have individual membership, but it, it it did have institutional membership um, and it tried to expand itself. So it started with um, mostly European members, uh, as I note here, six of them and, and the US, but by the, by the outbreak of, of the second world war, it actually included around 40 countries. So it was trying to expand itself. Um, in practice though, most of the debates took place mostly still among uh, the founding European members. So it was a de facto uh, still Eurocentric um, institution. Um, and then there was also, again, in, in this institution building, a sense of disciplinary exceptionalism that IR should be more uh, international than other sciences. So they actually had some quite interesting, in, in hindsight, quite uh, extreme experiments. Um, so one of, the, one of the arguments was that they wanted IR to have, be a traveling, uh, the, the International Studies Conference to be a traveling conference. It's hard to imagine today, but they, 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 uh, when we go to conferences in, in one country, but they actually had an idea that the conference itself would travel around 10, 15 um, countries over the course of 70 days, which tells you something about how much time perhaps academics had back then. Um, but this was a completely different view of what an international uh, association of IR should look like. It, it should be traveling around. They also had discussions about whether IR could even be taught in the same place or if students would then become nationalistic. So they should, the students should be sent around to different institutions. So this was a kind of institutionally trying to, to create a discipline that fosters um, a more international IR. And the final part of it was also just serving what's being done around the world. So this uh, IR around the world project that uh, Arlene Tickner and Olivera also uh, were, were part of, and also uh, Amit Savacharya and, and Barry Buzan. It, it, in, in, in a sense, in this light, it, it wasn't a new thing when, when they started doing that in the 2000s. This, is, this is, goes all the way back to the 20s and, and 30s. The second one was 
probably, as I said, the most idealistic one, um, which was to say that the spirit of IR should be completely different than any other um, uh, discipline. It should be internationalist. And this, this sort of correlated with a debate on whether IR should be normative or uh, positive. That's actually the terms they use. So there was a debate on positivism also or back then, uh, even though that's something we tend to uh, locate some, sometime in the 80s and 90s. Um, but they also, there was one part of the conference arguing that, that IR should, um, should actually uh, have an internationalist standpoint and a clear normative standpoint and um, others that it shouldn't. But this was a debate going on in the conference. Um, which related to this debate on normativity, positivism, uh, whether IR should be a, what some of them called international sociology, which is um, what's basically a, a, a descriptive empirical science. That's how they saw it, that describes world affairs. And another one, they saw it more as a kind of modern humanism. So um, again, I think this actually connects well back to, to the Professor Yun's, um, uh, the, the tension you identified, which is there already back then, whether it should be positivist or actually, um, there's a room for norm, normativity and values. Um, this, this goes all the way back. So that was the second one. <clears throat> and then that correlated with the, with the first institutional one as well, because if it should be internationalist, you couldn't really teach it in one country, could you? You would have to, to move around the world. And then the final one, which I think is the one that looks more like uh, IR around the world as we know it, um, centered less on, on promoting this, what some saw as a stifling, a homogenous, ideological internationalism affiliated with the league. And, and there was a lot of critics of that as well. Uh, they argued instead that what we should do is, is try to sympathetically understand national differences, that, that IR looks different from different places around the world. And um, that's what we need to understand, not promote some kind of uh, overall synthesis that unites everyone in internationalism. We should be more modest in that sense. Um, and the very organization of, of the ISC into these national committees, I think is, is, was an expression that actually they, they explicitly said that we're interested in national attitudes toward problems rather than a universal standpoint. Um, so this was critics who saw that this idea of a cosmopolitan science is, is, is impossible. I will always reflect some kind of national nuances different political moralities, which was what they were mostly interested in. Political moralities are different around the world and, and this is what we need to understand. So you could read this as a kind of realist approach. You could also read it as a, as a stress on situatedness rather than trying to overcome um, and homogenize in internationalism, actually take seriously that, that perspectives are situated and we need to bring out the special conditions that makes these perspectives different around the world. And then, only then, can we foster mutual understanding um, by overcoming these political misunderstandings. But they also even had, a, a, again, another quite curious project, which was a lexicon. Uh, so they, they tried to compile a lexicon of the words that are most likely to provoke conflict among nations, um, words which are most likely to be misunderstood. And then if you could um, actually uh, help with a lexicon, people might not misunderstand each other, which is, was sort of uh, curious, but also a little bit idealistic project. So I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up with, with the limits to, to, to the more international IR that they tried to bring about here. <clears throat> it ultimately failed for a number of reasons, including the fact that its sponsor, the League failed and Rockefeller Foundation drew its support because it thought it was completely irrelevant. So there was a lot of financial, disciplinary, political, other um, reasons why the ISC failed. Hans Morgenthau uh, and other post-war realists were incredibly critical of the more interdisciplinary way it was functioning and so on. Um, but it also failed, that's what we're arguing here, because it was, despite trying to make IR more international, founded on a distinctly Eurocentric grounds. So the institution building that they tried to make was predominantly towards Anglo-European institutions. 
it was very limited in terms of non-European representation. And if it was, uh, it was, they were especially interested in the views from the great imperial powers. So they were very um, anxious about getting Japan in because they wanted to hear Japan's uh, view on, on, on current international problems. Not so much, for example, other um, Asian, Latin American uh, countries, um, and certainly not the colonies. They didn't even think about um, having representatives from the colonies. Uh, even though the colonies were a central part of all these debates, which was um, quite striking. And then the internationalism that they were promoting was also parochially European in the way that when you read it, you can see it as an attempt to promote peace in Europe, even at the expense of, of colonies. So one of the uh, main conferences in 1937 was about, could we exchange, redistribute colonies in order to appease Germany uh, and Italy and Japan? Uh, which was primarily about um, a Eurocentric piece, in a sense. Um, and then also, again, thirdly, the different national perspectives they examined were, again, also mostly among these Anglo-European great powers. So in a sense, you could read it as not an international conference, but an inter-imperial conference, a forum for inter-imperial exchanges. Um, so one of the main debates and something that's kind of written out of IR history E.H. Uh, e. Carr was there, and, and those of you who remember his uh, 20 years crisis will see that um, the, the conflict between the haves and the have-nots is quite prominent in his uh, discussion on peaceful change. Um, he, I think he, he, he almost played, plagiarized that from the ISC conference on peaceful change, um, where they discussed a lot about the haves and have-nots, but these were imperial haves and have-nots. What they had were empires, or what they didn't have was we don't have advice. And that's sort of written out of the history by now. So there are some lessons not learned here. Um, I think uh, we think the ISC ex experiment here with making IR more international is illustrative because it, it illustrates some of the pitfalls of searching only for national geographical pluralism uh, and representativeness. So it, it failed to reflect itself on how these debates were actually exclusionary themselves, how they were actually also embedded within a Eurocentric imperialist worldview. They didn't really reflect on that. They just thought if they could include a few more people from around the world, then all would be fine. Uh, but what they were discussing in practice was, was some quite disturbing uh, things. Of course, we also end up by saying contemporary global IR discourse takes place on a, a less, even not if not a, you know explicitly anti-imperialist, anti-colonial founding. So when that's not the argument here that 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 the contemporary debate uh, risks the same. Um, but but there are some of the pitfalls um, of that project, and and especially in the final ones here that we're gonna point to is that. Well, what is the purpose of global IR? Is it to make it more international in the sense of having people from more countries around the world? Or is it to make it less colonial, less imperialist and less racist? It's because certainly ISC tried the former, but they failed spectacularly at the latter. Um, on the contrary, it was when they brought in more people, especially the Italians, some of the Italian participants were explicitly white supremacists. So IR became more international, but it certainly became much more imperialist and racist. Um, then the second one is, well, can IR be globalized from the core in the way that they tried at the International Studies Conference? And to some extent, you could argue that the ISA and, and, and American conferences are trying to do today. Simply by making the core more open and aware to, to differences IR has done elsewhere, but otherwise keep the core intact. And this, I think, uh, relates to the previous uh, presentation on if the positivist core, for example, remains intact. What, what globalizes then? Yeah. <clears throat> and then, <clears throat> is there a politics and history of pluralistic universalism, a limited pluralistic universalism? that lies at the foundation of these global IR projects that we need to bring out more. This is more of an open question. And then um, also, well, certainly in the 30s and 20s and 30s, there was something inherently colonialist in the core disciplines uh, attempt to globalize its version of IR. 
And I think it's worth asking those questions sometimes um, today as well. I'll finish here, thanks. Right, uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Christensen uh, for your uh, paper. And I think we all appreciate your participation despite a huge difference uh, uh, between time. As we do not have much time to discuss all the papers, I think it is better to jump to the question and answer session at once. We had four very uh, exciting papers this afternoon and this uh, very early morning to you, Professor Christensen, by Professor Chan, uh, Kasana, Un, and Christensen, and all uh, looking at different ways in which to move beyond the traditional Eurocentric and US dominated international relations discourse and making our, our IR more global. I'm certain there will be many questions, but due to the time limit, I will receive all the questions first and ask each presenter to answer them in order. And as a moderator, I urge you to ask just one question to each presenter. And please very be very short on your questions and answers because we have to end on time and to give at least one or two minutes to uh, Professor Chan so that he can uh, make a final uh, wrapping up remark. And I'm sure that Professor Un uh, will circulate Professor Chin's keynote speech. So if there is a question, please uh, go on. May I? Oh, he's frozen. Anne's thumbnail is frozen, I guess. Or, my, or I don't know. Should we wait? Uh, Yong Sui, you are muted. I think Professor An's computer is went down again. So why don't you, Professor Chan, go ahead, go go with your your, your questions, comments. Right. Uh, His computer works only for two hours, not more. <laughs> <laughs> the morning session was the same. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah, we have to find a new computer for him. <laughs> well, actually, the question is to uh, you, Professor Un. Very simple question from your uh, excellent survey. Can we? say that positivism is uh, is the main characteristic of uh, Western IR because, you know, interpretivists or ethnographists, they are all Western theorists, actually. So there are many Westerners, people mm -hmm. from Western countries who mm -hmm. does an excellent job mm -hmm. uh, in the sure. way, except positivism. So mm -hmm. uh, if you have any opinion about that, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, I just presented the uh, general trend that we could identify based on the data uh, that we could gather from, say, trip. You know, the trip project uh, led or run by the College of William Mary, as well as the uh, uh, series of survey that I had done with my colleagues, including why you here uh, since uh, from so last year, from, right from last year until. Uh, March uh, this year, uh, that there there is a clear uh, uh, tendency that we commit to positivism as a as a as an epistemological foundation upon which to guide our empirical analysis or produce our theoretical analysis. Uh, of course, there are uh, a good number of uh, Western as well as non-Western scholars who prefer. Uh, I would say, including myself, post-positivist perspectives, such as the post-colonialism, critical eye of theory, and so on and so forth. But just um, in terms of the general trends, uh, positivism remains dominant influences across uh, various IR communities, whether they are Eastern, whether they are Asian or uh, American or European. Uh, yeah, to less extent European, but American and and Asian, and that's one of the key points that I was trying to make. We need to, uh, how to say, we need to broaden. I mean, at the moment, uh, I see that the normative power, an ability to define what count or what can count as a good IR theory, what can count as a valid way of doing IR, 
uh, occupied by or taken by some, uh, not some, the majority of our scholars committed to positivism. We have to, uh, as far as I'm concerned, to broaden that, uh, that normative, uh, normative power. And as a way of doing so, I propose the autobiography or autoethnographical approach to the practice of global, global IR. And that's, I think, one of the way to um, go beyond certain uh, nationalism or even ethnocentrism, something that Professor An has been uh, taking, taking issue with uh, throughout this workshop. Because, uh, uh, you know, whenever, I mean, whenever I tell my personal uh, stories about what has made me um, um, frustrate struggle and why I feel uh, frustrated, even, even discouraged, and when I try to do IL differently, uh, employing post positivist perspectives um, here in you know, my local IL community, South Korean IL community, where just few positivist traditional IL theories remain dominant influences. Um, I see my story travel uh, beyond a national uh, boundary and having a resonance with other marginalized, especially post-positivists, whose voices, by the way, tend to remain at the margin of the discipline uh, and who also want to do IL differently, whether they, whether they are located in, in the West or, or not. Uh, so that's, that's, the, uh, that's the virtue uh, of the autobiography as far as I'm concerned. So that, uh, that's uh, uh, one of the effective way to uh, address the possible uh, pitfalls of, of uh, ethnocentrism or nationalism that global IR uh, might encounter, yes. Uh, right. Um, I was I was uh, unexpectedly moved off from from the uh, from the Zoom. Sorry. And uh, 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 Professor Chan and, and Eun, do we have much time to uh, continue discussion, or should we try to wrap up within a few minutes? Um, I was told the problem of if there is any person who should. Uh, yes. 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 Mm. So. So, so I, I think then we can take about one or two questions more. So if, yeah. if there is any mm. questions, then please. I think Peter just raised his hand. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so I have a question to your last um, suggestion about margins connecting to margins, which, so my impression is just that it's, it, this, this question of positivism is, is a tricky one because on the one hand, you could say there's a recognition dilemma. And if you don't wanna do something too different, but wanna be recognized for um, doing, um, you know, let's take the to Yan Shitong example in China, but, but, but actually using Chinese philosophy to, mm. to come up with an IR theory, and then mm. you might just do positivism as a strategic device to get it accepted, recognized in mm. America and the United States. I can see why that strategy might be one. It, it's, it's a different one than, than the one you're suggesting. Um, but also the, there's also some pitfalls of the margins connecting to margins, and then you remain on the margins. <laughs> uh, so, 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 so what? maybe it's just a, a question what, what each strategy would, what kind of change would each strategy lead to? Because if the margins uh, geographically connect to the epistemological margins on say autobiography, mm. how much change will we get? Whereas I'm not necessarily in, an advocate of what, what Professor Yen is doing, but, but that is actually a way of, of inserting Chinese IR into the core. Mm. Um, I just wonder what your thoughts are on that. Mm. Okay, um, that's one of the issues that I that I've been taking issue with as well. Because uh, I mean, in in my earlier work, I also propose um, uh, as a way of uh, strategy, we we need to uh, embrace existing mainstream IL theories as a way of uh, having a dialogue with the mainstream 
in order for us to stay or in order for us to talk to them, in order for us to be recognized as one of, to be accepted in their uh, field, of, field of knowledge or market of knowledge, shall, I, shall we say, right? Um, uh, but then uh, uh, if we just start accepted by the, by the mainstream, we just, uh, it, 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 it does not uh, achieve the true uh, objective of the global IR, uh, which is a promotion of a greater diversity in our thinking in, in the knowledge productions. And that's, uh, that's, that's why I, uh, uh, I move myself toward a more autobiographical, autoethnographic approach to the practice of uh, a global IR. So now I'm saying, or now I am calling for like the pluriversality as opposed to universality. I mean, the, the any attempts to develop national school of IR or non-Western IR theorization uh, tend, to, tend to work to be recognized by the mainstream, like the American or Anglo-American, Anglo-European uh, scholarship. Uh, but in order, I mean, if our aim remains in that area, then uh, uh, it is very difficult for us to uh, keep the local perspectives, indigenous experiences, because uh, like I said before, the universality or general applicability uh, it, it, uh, flattens out. I mean, in order for us to, uh, if we go that direction, uh, somehow these local richness uh, are to be flattened out, right, uh, to achieve universality. And that is not uh, the gist of global IR, that is not the gist of the main aims, main objective of the global IR. So uh, I think we need to think about uh, polar universality as opposed, as opposed to uh, universality. You know, the, the particular, uh, not as particular, but particular as universal, not in the sense that particular local indigenous perspectives uh, can be applied to other locations, other culture, but in the sense that uh, it, it, it can be foundation in its own uh, upon which to, uh, to, to base, base the scientific or legitimate uh, uh, knowledge uh, and, and, and the political authority, you know, and so on. So um, I think we should accept the local uh, as, a, as an end in itself. Uh, 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 when it comes to thinking about political authority, subjectivity, and agency. So, yeah. Mm. Uh, right. Uh, Professor Chan, uh, uh, should, he, should, he, uh, should he wrap up the discussion? Yep, I guess so. Right. So, do you take turns among the presenters, or is this the concluding remarks? Uh, concluding remark, perhaps. Uh, if, if you, if there is no other uh, question, then can you? Okay. So, for, so the concluding remarks for the whole day, or just for for this session? It may be whole day. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Before we end, uh, Professor Wikasana, do you have anything to say? Because three of us mm. said something. <laughs> Not really. Mm. Okay, well, time is up. Uh, thank you very much, Professor An, for moderating this session. And uh, for the whole day, thank you very much for the participation, uh, the panelists, uh, all of them, and especially uh, Chung Chi, you've been here for, for one day. And then I see some familiar names in the audience, uh, some from South Korea, from some from, uh, you know, abroad. So thank you very much for watching. And I think this is just the beginning of the study in South Korea about global IR. So Professor Eun has taken initiative to, you know, uh, have all these prominent scholars from all over the world. So as Professor Christensen asked, probably IR as a discipline does not trouble, but, you know, IR scholars, we trouble uh, across the borders, at least through Zoom. So uh, thank you very much. And I think we can have another time to get together uh, and, and we can learn uh, to, uh, a lot from each other again. So again, thank you very much for your participation.
and have a good day, good night, good morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye, bye, -bye. everyone.